to episode 35 of The Descent is Easy. I'm Ruth. And I'm Michelle. This is the podcast episode for season three, episode five, Stronger Than Heaven. And before we get into that, we've got about half an hour of last week to catch up on, I feel. Yeah, for my money. There was a kind of conversation that I was holding back on having last week because they might have got to it this week, Mm -hmm. which is basically the Raphael and Izzy thing beyond the scene itself, which we talked about at some length. But the repercussions of that and the sort of broader implications of that was something that I was sort of not wanting to talk about last week in case they got to it this week. They did not. They did not. His name was mentioned once apropos kind of nothing at all. Mm. So we now have to talk about it. Which, to be fair, we have to anyway, because we had two separate write-ins in regards to Isabel and Raphael fair and well, everything. Well, let's hear those first and then maybe we can kind of frame our conversation around that. <laughs> So we've had Cat Space writing on Tumblr saying that she really liked David Castro in the episode and that he cries beautifully, which he does. Yep. And she goes on to say that the only issue she had was with Izzy's reaction to finding out what Raphael had been up to. Maybe it was because I was feeling protective towards him, but Izzy has done things herself that a clave wouldn't approve of and the Shadowhunters themselves are no strangers to torture. I don't know, does she even have the authority to banish someone? Wouldn't that be up to Alec? Mm. I really hope that this isn't the last we'll see of Raphael. And on a similar note, we also had a write-in from Content in Vain. They agreed with us that episode four was a little underwhelming and that what bothered her most was the vampire subplot and basically goes on to say that Izzy and Clary's involvement reminded them of how much they hated episode 103. Yeah. That the first time it aired, it didn't bother them so much because we didn't know much about vampires and the way that Shadowhunters were acting. We could just assume that they were inherently evil. However, on rewatch, they found the whole thing sickening. Alex's comment about how this is fun and Izzy's taunting comments, everyone celebrating Clary's first kill. I mean, all of which is absolutely true. It is. I mean, I think there has to be a kind of awareness metatextually that they have reset the rules somewhat since then. Yeah. Quite a lot of the stuff that we were getting in early season one was not in any way indicative of the world we were going to be building from mid to late season one onwards. Mm. That even over the course of season one, they firmed up those rules and the sort of boundaries of where they were and where all of these people fell in that spectrum. Is the early season one is very much here's a fun adventure right. demon hunting program right. in which we kill a lot of stuff. Absolutely. On rewatch. That's problematic. From where we are now, yeah. absolutely it is. But I, I think there's a difficulty in the metatextuality coming up against textuality, which is obviously that, you know, season one, episode three is canon because it's season one, episode yeah. three. That's part of the canon. But in the way that you quite often get, sometimes get between like a pilot episode and the series proper. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We kind of treat season one like a pilot mm-hmm. entirely. You go back and watch season one, episode one of The Big Bang Theory, and they are just different characters. Yeah. You know, and there's a number of series that have that kind of pilot. And we are sort of forced to treat season one in its entirety like it's mm. a pilot, which it isn't, which makes that difficult. But I do think we've reset that slightly. So that if we did the same plot now, their responses would be very, very different. Not just because our characters are now in a different place. And of course, one of the massive problems we're running into is that their responses aren't all that different. Because Content in Vain goes on to say that is is well done to Clary killing this vampire in the most recent episode is a problem and that Clary especially should have been more sympathetic to Leo's conundrum because Simon went through this. And it wasn't actually something that triggered me last week Mm. because there is an element of you watching a fantasy show and they're killing the bad guys. But we, of course, don't dehumanise vampires in this programme. Leo's done literally nothing wrong. Well, I kind of disagree that Clary and Isabel's treatment of Leo is equatable to the Shadowhunters' behaviour in season one, episode three. I think one of the things that I noticed about that scene, and for whatever reason we didn't talk about it last week, but they actually work quite hard not to kill Leo. Mm -hmm. Isabel's the one who goes in first. She tries to restrain him with her whip several times. He comes at them hard. He is coming at them with the intent of killing them. And it is only as a last resort that they kill him. Yeah, but we are dealing with new vampire bloodlust. I totally accept that if Leo had been a character who we cared more about, 
that wouldn't have been the way the scene mm. went down. But I do think that there was an attempt textually in that scene to demonstrate restraint mm. on Isabel and Clary's part. And I think that's important, that attention to demonstrate restraint, because, you know, the Shadowhunters have also recently demonstrated that they have no compunction killing something that is coming at them with the intent to kill. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, there is a kill or be killed kind of a situation yeah. and they don't shy f- from that behaviour. You know, they kill Circle members and mm. Circle members are, at the very least, Nephilim. Yeah. Most of whom were, you know, by all accounts, mundanes who had been transformed into Nephilim against their will or information. You know, so and it's like should be put on trial rather than right. sentenced to death. But they killed them. Yeah, and that's not because of a kind of racism towards Nephilim. You know, that's because they have a kill or be killed kind of a mentality when it comes to these things. They live in a world in which killing people is not an uncrossable line. Mm. No, I take that point. I think what it narrows down to is 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 well done, which is very much in line with Sit, Good Doggy, and other various throwaway lines that Izzy gets given because they kind of sound cool. Oh, totally. And I totally, totally think that last week was indicative of issues that Isabel specifically has Mm. in regards to downworld racism. I just want to kind of hesitate to equate that scene with Leo to 103, which is problematic, but was a long time ago, and we have reset slightly since then. Yeah, and yeah, I yeah. do think that it's different. That, however, doesn't mean that the scene with Leo doesn't play into a problematic dismissal from Isabel specifically within the context of this plot line of vampire human rights kind yeah. of thing. Or any structure of the Shadowhunters. I don't know where she gets the authority to banish Raphael from New York. No. I mean, Other than he's going to listen to her. Except sort of what she's saying is leave New York or I will bring about the weight of the clave. Yeah, I suppose she's not actually banishing him from New York. She's letting him escape. Yeah. Hmm. And I mean, I still have the issue that I had last week, which is that <laughs> I don't know why she thinks he needs banishing, effectively. I and don't, why the Clave would care. I don't know what crimes she's actually accusing him of at this point. I mean, the Clave totally don't need all that strong a reasoning to be racist. They don't, though equally, it was a vampire torturing another vampire. I'm not sure why they'd give a stuff mm. either way. Yeah, they might not care. In terms of a question about whether... Isabel is stepping on Alec or the Clave's toes in terms of an authority structure. She's not purely because she is deliberately going outside that authority structure. Yeah, yeah. She's telling him to leave or she will presumably go to Alec, start the Clave bringing the full weight of dodgy justice down on his head. Yeah, the problem isn't actually undermining Alec's authority. The problem is going behind Alec's back. Yes, yes, absolutely. Because the thing that I kind of thought might come into play at some point in this episode is the fact that she has, without telling anybody, removed the leader of the New York vampire clan from his position. Oh, I know. So he's just, as far as Isabel's concerned, he's yeah. just gone. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing, is obviously there's a terrifying power vacuum about to happen. Right. That, at the end of the day, Alec and all the rest of them are going to have to deal with. Yes. But until Raphael actually, actually leaves... Right. It's a kind of... It has no point. Exactly. How in all the world are we not picking up on this? But then, this entire episode takes place over one day. So, maybe next episode, when it's tomorrow... Right. We might address it. Yeah. And yeah, Content in Vain goes on to say that the whole how could you hurt someone else to help yourself that Izzy says to Raphael is incredibly hypocritical and self-righteous. Seeing as season one, the Shadowhunters spend most of the time running around and messing stuff up for selfish reasons and that Raphael especially suffered because of their actions. That they released Camille, which resulted in who knows how many mundane deaths and Raphael being tortured and almost killed. And let's not forget Izzy betraying Raphael's confidence and using Rosa to threaten him because Simon was paranoid and... They finish saying that they really dislike how the narrative treats her compared to other Shadowhunters. Alec, for example, started off as intolerant, but he gradually improved, and when he occasionally backslides, he is called on it and suffers consequences. Izzy, on the other hand, was billed as progressive and open-minded from day one, but she keeps acting in problematic ways. 103, 203, 304. I mean, all of those moments where yeah. she uses casual racial slurs and other various yeah. things that we have called out across the podcast. And instead of being called out, those incidents are framed as bad as heroic moments which really reminds me of her killing keely yes yeah we had quite a long conversation about that point the hero shot Mm. 
totally. This is an issue that we've had with Isabel before. This is a kind of ongoing issue. I'm not sure I have anything particularly new to say about it other than, yeah, it's still problematic. Mm. There's a really difficult thing that's been difficult about Isabel and Raphael's relationship throughout, which is that ultimately it's deeply unhealthy. You know, we've talked at length about the myriad ways in which it's deeply unhealthy, but it wasn't just unhealthy because they were both addicts. You know, it was unhealthy because they were coming to the relationship from a place that wasn't anything to do with having a respect for each other. Yeah. Irregardless of the drug use. Their kind of connection built through that. Right. And then they never quite reset it to a point where yeah. they started from scratch. Totally. I mean, I guess most of this just has to wait until we see Raphael again, sort of, to see how this all comes out in the wash. Because, yeah, there's major difficulties with Isabel's behaviour at the end of last episode that may be more or less problematic given the ramifications of that behaviour. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. it's kind of, obviously it doesn't make the thing she did any better, but if it doesn't have the consequence that there's a huge power vacuum and therefore war in the vampire section of the downworld and disaster, disaster, that's a really bad outcome, but it might be that Raphael hasn't actually left the city, so the outcome is more personal between her and Raphael. Yes. Kind of. And we will find out if she's actually going to follow through with that threat that she made, Mm -hmm. because she may or may not be able to do so. Yeah. I mean, I guess we also have to wait and see whether anybody else finds out about Heidi. I feel at some point Simon has to find out. Well quite because she touched all of his stuff yeah and the question i suppose becomes whether once heidi finds simon which is surely what the next Mm. thing that happens with heidi is is does simon go to other people to get them involved to get their help or does he try and resolve it on his own at which point isabel's sort of responsible for any ill fate that may befall simon at that point yeah absolutely Because aside from the downworld politics of it all, Heidi's on the loose. Raphael was the only person who knew about her and was the only person who was doing anything about keeping her under control. You're forgetting about Josh. Maybe. Though he didn't have, you know, a name or a personality, so I'm not putting too much stock in his, like, narrative role at this point. Name's Josh. (laughs) No, the actor's name's Josh. (laughs) Also, it might not be Josh. I might be making that up. (laughs) But Raphael's behaviour in regards to Heidi was unconscionable, but it was keeping her under control. Yeah. And clearly she needed keeping under control. She's on the loose now. So. And she's crazy. Yeah. That's going to have an effect. You know, yeah. that's going to have a powerful effect on things going forward. And Condit and Vane finished their comment with, yeah, another moment of me going, oh my God, yes, that thing. Because the show forgets about it and that's why I forget about it. Mm -hmm. That, of course, not just a power vacuum, but Izzy banning Raphael from New York means that Alec has lost a second member of his Danworld cabinet yep. after he's lost Magnus. Yep. Which, yeah, that Danworld cabinet thing that Lorenzo Ray is now on and possibly some new crazy vampire who we don't know and who might not like the idea of playing ball with the Nephilim. Yes, totally. That is a potential consequence. I mean, I feel kind of like that's so far ahead of where we are with this. You know, because at this point, if a different vampire turned up at the council meeting, Alec would have absolutely no idea why. Yeah. It would be one way to make it all come out. It would, yeah. But, you know, we are again coming up against the fact that we really don't know anything about the vampires, how the vampires work or have any connections within the vampires apart from Raphael himself and Simon and that Simon's kind of removed from them now. I mean, I suppose one of the silver linings of this whole thing might be that we get to know some more members of the New York vampire clan, which would be really interesting. Like Josh. For instance... (laughs) And then we had a write-in from Green Tea Lodgy Jelly about our confusion with tracking. Yeah, it turns out we were really overcomplicating things. (laughs) (laughs) Which we do now understand and aren't entirely sure why we let things get so complicated in the first place. Lodgy Jelly writes, I just listened to your latest podcast and I think you're making the tracking thing way too complicated. And it's like, Mm -hmm. yeah, Mm -hmm. turns out we were. So the rules of tracking in Shadowhunter's world is that you can track a person using something that belongs to that person. They don't track items using items. They always track people. And I went back and I watched the kind of first four episodes in which we do tracking in season one. Mm -hmm. And A, oh my God, people were bad at acting in season one. (laughs) It was such a weird throwback. But yeah. Literally, Clary tears the button off Magnus's coat and then Jace goes, well, the button belongs to Magnus so we can track Magnus with this button. I don't know why we got all turned around in our heads. Yeah, I don't know. Thanks so much for clearing that up. It's going to make life so much easier going forward. (laughs) 
one frustration to check off the list, I suppose. Yeah. One of the things that I was pondering in regards to possession and why they could and then couldn't track Leo is that if we actually are going with items that belong to people, then, of course, once you're dead, you don't have any worldly possessions. And once you're undead, I suppose your stuff belongs to you again. So that kind of works. Yeah. Yeah. Which would also explain why you can't track a dead body, because a dead body hasn't got stuff. Yeah, fair enough. I mean, that kind of seems a stupid way for tracking to work, but it is consistent, so I can't really yeah. grumble about that, really. Now, there's two other things that I wanted to talk about in regards to last week. One of them is a quite quickly wrapped up, and it's kind of last week and now this week. I think Happy Drunk Alec is moving further and further away. He is so very much out of our grasp now. <laughs> I'm not going to rule him out because we're only just finished episode five. Yep. I don't think we are now in a... And Magnus and Alec are going to be miserable mostly from this point till the end. Mm. I don't think that's the case. I think we're going to have a little down bump with this thing and then they'll get over it to a greater or less degree and then we'll have more issues later on. We've had a lot of teasers about this season. There were a lot of sort of tidbits of information that we had thrown about. Mm. I really don't want to get into trying to pin the teasers to the narrative arc that we can see progressing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You Do know? we even know that Drunk Alec is in 3A? I don't know. Mm. Anyway, all I'm saying is I'm slightly worried and I'm now more worried. I think we should be worried about Alec. Yeah. I think we should definitely be worried about Alec from last week, continued into this week and probably continued into next week. He's not in a good place and that's interesting and we'll talk about it extensively later, I'm sure. But yeah, in terms of the specifics, in terms of drunk scenes and French toast coffee mornings <laughs> and training scenes and any other sort of tidbit that we've had thrown at us ahead of time. Yeah, I really don't want to try and fit those into... Right. Right. Yeah. Let's just leave them be because they're teasers that mean nothing out of context. Yeah. That's yeah. kind of the point. We got the teaser George before the season started as well without any context for it meaning anything. George could have been, you know, the hamster that Magnus adopted a hundred years ago. It could have been the name of the dog that Luke licked. It could have been the name of the dog that licked Luke, yes. It could have been, you know, the postman that helps them with the investigation this week. Yeah, it could yeah, have yeah. been anyone or anything. And it turned out to be this person in this context, which is obviously weighty and significant in terms of like Malik relationship conversation. But these things can mean a myriad of things in a myriad of different contexts and locations. And it is a fool's game to try and pin them to specific points of the narrative timeline. Yeah. And all that's going to happen is that all your theories are going to get jost. Right. Yeah. Now, the last thing that I wanted to talk about was that fandom this week made me really sad. <laughs> I think what they addressed with Jason mental health last week was beautifully done. I think that it's such a good job with how Jace was dealing with it, with how Jace was dealing with being confronted with it, yep. with how he lashed out at people that were confronting him, yep. and then how he start to accept it and try and deal with it and they're continuing this beautifully into this episode and I know there's a lot of people that don't like Jace as a character that are bored of Clary and Jace that mm -hmm. are bored of your white cis male hero types yep I get that but the general dismissal of his pain and his arc I found really problematic this week. I really struggled mm. seeing so many people so casually dismiss this beautiful representation of mental health. Yeah, I think there's a tendency to forget how screwed up Jace is. Yeah. And how much emotional baggage he carries with him. How much baggage he carried before any of this happened. Right. Yeah. It's really easy to get swept up in Jace as... An example of that quintessential white straight male hero type, mm. like to get bored of him before he's done anything just because of what he represents yeah. and narrative heritage he represents. And he's also something that, you know, we last week had to hold our hands up in regards to our dismissal of Russell. And we kind of concluded in the end that one of the reasons that we were quite so harsh on Russell is because he was mean to Maya and Simon. And we really like Maya and Simon. Totally. And of course, a lot of the hate that Jace is getting is because he 
he's making Alex's job impossible. Mm -hmm. He's keeping him in the dark. He's treating his parapetai badly. And people really like Alec. I completely get it. I really like Alec. Yeah. But I do think we are just not seeing enough sympathy for Jace's state of mind. You're not obliged to be sympathetic. You know, there's not an obligation within the story to be sympathetic. I think there is an obligation within the story to not be dismissive. Mm. And those are two separate things. Mm. Like, you're under no obligation as as a viewer of this television program to feel sympathy or empathy or compassion for what Jace is going through. No, no. To feel for him. You're not obliged to do that in any way, shape or form. I think what it's problematic to do is dismiss it because Jace is Jace. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You know, he's going through a thing. He's going through a thing which we are textually discussing within the context of the show that is going to have echoes and reverberations in the other characters and not just in his relationships with the other characters, but in the other characters and the way they think about themselves and Mm -hmm. him as a reflection of themselves. He doesn't exist in an isolated bubble. Yeah. I think to dismiss that is to be missing an interesting bit of the show is to mm-hmm. be missing this kind of interesting storyline which i think is really positive i think it's compelling and i think it's important and you know jace as a abuse survivor has always been something that is in the background is subtextual to everything that jace is and i think it's really important to not forget that yeah 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 so yeah, I can totally see your frustration. I mean, I'm, honestly, I haven't been online that much this week, so it's not been something that I've observed. But you don't have to like Jace. You don't have to like him. No. You don't have to empathise with him. You don't have to sympathise with him. You don't have to feel for him. But I think to dismiss his bit of the plot line is a little short-sighted, maybe. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, and I do think a lot of my sadness is down to the fact that the show's doing a really beautiful job in telling this story and dealing with the mental health, which it turns out isn't what it is. But I think all of the reactions last week were really, really spot on. And I just think you're missing a really nice bit of storytelling and a really nice bit of writing and a really nice bit of acting Yeah, if you just ignore it all. At the moment, it is the beginnings of quite a nice storyline. You mm. know, I think it is potentially a really nice thing that they're doing i don't think we've got far enough into it to kind of make a a solid judgment and you know they were doing something really interesting with alex mental health last season and then dropped it dropped it yeah and that's problematic you know the entering into that discussion and then dropping it is problematic yeah difficult Yeah, yeah yeah there's nothing saying that they will do that with this conversation that they're having with jace now but there's nothing saying they won't either Mm. so watch that space i suppose yeah but and in a perfect world, you would, of course, then have those two storylines meet and then discuss them at the same time. Right. But I guess his mental health issues are just as real and just as significant and just as important in terms of representation. Like, we don't have enough people talking about mental mm. health issues on television. We certainly don't have enough men talking about mental health issues on television. White says straight men. Right. Yeah. You know, the, they're dealing with that textually is really interesting and significant i think it's a really positive thing i think that that is a plot line that i'm really engaged with this season Mm. and you know i don't have any issues particularly with jace as a character there have been issues with the way the show has treated him in terms of the plot mule thing that we've talked about several times there's difficult moments and jace is not an easy character you know he behaves in a way towards people that is problematic and he's not always the nicest guy but you know somebody doesn't have to be good or even likable for them to be interesting yeah you don't have to like all of the characters Mm. that doesn't make them not worth being on your television right right it just feels to me for a fandom that is spending so much time applauding the show's representation to dismiss this entire chunk of representation is just a bit short-sighted i think that's fair which is sad anything else that you wanted to catch up on from last week before we go into quotes that are to die for and then our actual episode I don't think so. Dum dum dum. I don't think so. So just to recap, my hint was that while I didn't like a lot of Lilith's expose, I did really like this quote. Yep. And your hint was a character calling out another character on their BS. Yep. So we had a write-in from Green Tea Lighty Jelly, who for you said Heidi's comment about how touching that you were burning me for my own good. Good line. 
not correct, but good line. And for me, he said, Lilith, I loved him with all my heart and I never knew if he loved me back until you killed him. Which, also a good line. And yeah, actually, I did like that one too. But it wasn't the quote that I chose, I'm afraid. Your hint was misleading. I didn't realise that there was more than one <laughs> actual thing I liked that Lilith said. I thought it was literally just that one line. I realised there's two now. <laughs> and then we had a writer from Cat Space who guessed, for such an ugly, despicable species, they do make beautiful things, which was the line that I did like from Lilith. Yep. And for you, guest, are you really telling me there is no use in changing bigoted behaviour? And it goes on to say that she's pretty sure that your quote was my own Luke, but she had a hard time deciding which exact line. Totally fair, and that is a good line, and my quote is from the Maya and Luke exchange. The line I actually was referring to was, I can't believe those words just came out of your mouth. Yes. Which I like because of the echo to all of those conversations anybody's ever had with anybody about that kind of subject matter. Mm -hmm. At some point, somebody says something and somebody else says, I literally can't believe you just said that. Yeah, it's the echo of how very dare you. Right. It makes the issue that they're discussing exactly the same or exactly the same level as issues that one has had in one's real life that aren't about werewolves, but are about race or gender or sexuality or whatever else you know Mm -hmm. so yeah that was the line i planned for and all my fantasies a third person wrote in and also got for such an ugly and despicable species they do make beautiful things for me indeed well done and for you said so you're willing to let someone else go through all this pain so your life can be better isabel to Raphael, of course (laughs) which turns out i think your hint was misleading it's one of the interesting things that I've kind of realised playing this game. We give those hints and it feels to me like there's just one thing <laughs> and then we get right hints and you just get this really nice moment of realising that Shadowhunters writing team does put the theme across the entire yeah, yeah. episode. It's well like, done, oh, yeah. There and there and there as well. It's all over the place. Yeah. I mean, we can't promise any consistency about the effectiveness or, you know, misleadingness of our hints. It's just potluck. You're just going to (laughs) have to roll with it. But yes, runes will be issued to All My Fantasies are third person and Cat Space. Cat Space, who is now one rune away from winning her prize. Ooh. (laughs) We shouldn't set a sound effect there. It's like... (laughs) We can't afford sound effects. You have to pay for those. Ooh. Nice. (laughs) And I believe that's everything for last week. Thank you, all three of you who wrote in with guesses. Thank you. So, shall we get into the episode? I think we probably should. It's going to be long enough as it is. (laughs) So, as previously mentioned, this is Season 3, Episode 5, Stronger Than Heaven. It was written by Brian Milken and directed by Jeff Schotts and first aired on the 17th of April 2018. I think this might be the first outing for both of those people. I was literally just about to ask you because I don't recognise either of those names. Yeah, I think it is. I think it's a first outing for both of those individuals. So, welcome to the Shadowhunters team. And both. And nice work. There's some beautiful directing going on There's in this episode. There's some really beautiful direction going on in this episode. Yeah. And some interesting writing. Yeah. I think this episode suffers from some of the same bittiness Mm -hmm. that the previous episode did. It still feels very much like we're kind of checking in with everybody and we're sort of lacking a central A plot. Yeah. Which is not something I would have ever anticipated complaining (laughs) about with this show. It's also really weird seeing as we've dropped an entire storyline for this episode and it still feels like it's too busy. Yeah, I think maybe they're missing a kind of centralisation of plot that no one of these plots felt like the main plot mm-hmm, mm-hmm. like sort of Clary's should have been the main event seeing as that's what feeds into the like overarching narrative yeah. but it didn't really feel like it was given any more like space or weight than anything else I think especially because you start off with Jason Clary together and then you split them into their own storyline yeah. and you spend equal amounts of time on both of them therefore yeah. kind of halving the time you give to that A plot right so it kind of felt like we needed a bit more of a focus in this mm. episode. But I did really enjoy it. So we open up directly where we left off with Magnus and Lilith yeah. in Magnus's loft, indeed. Lilith needs a potion to remove love. She says she's a friend of Ragnar's. Magnus says that he would do anything for a friend of Ragnar's because apparently he's become an idiot since he opened the door to Lilith. He, yeah. What? You don't say stuff like that to strangers. No, he's stupid than his interaction with Lilith. It kind of feels like maybe she hypnotised him or something when he opened the door. It would explain a lot. Because this is quite a major potion to give over to someone, right? This is like a, oh yeah, no, just sliver off a bit of your soul 
and feed it to him and he'll forget he ever loved you. Yeah. It's all a bit weird the way they've set this up because you've got Magnus going, I've got this elixir, but we really, really shouldn't. Bad, yep. bad, bad, bad. Yeah. And then instantly reaching for a ladle on his desk and pouring it into a bottle and going, there you go. Yeah. So for an elixir he was really worried about, he sure has it handy. I mean, he didn't say it was a complicated elixir, I suppose, because he pours like two ingredients into a little thing and... Yeah, and goes done yeah sorted so that's a bit odd but then you've also got this sliver of the soul thing which is a dramatic thing yes like who knew that we could do that and not just that we can do that but the fact that magnus goes surely you know how it goes he makes it sound like that's the kind of thing you learned just after transportation yeah and you kind of get the sense that maybe the whole carve off a sliver of your soul thing is sort of equivalent to, you know, other magical things that are about, like, imbuing it with your magic or your spirit or your whatever, you know, the kind of tying it to your personal energy in some yeah, yeah, way. Yeah. But the kind of carve off a bit of your soul. Mm. It's like, how much soul do you have to carve? Like, yeah. does it damage your soul? Does the bit of soul grow, grow back? back. <laughs> like, we, uh, we have not got enough information on how souls work in Shadowhunters Verse for me to be comfortable with going around yeah. carving bits off anybody's <laughs> soul. And the thing that's weird about it, of course, is that we got Lilith saying it to the oily demon in the promo last week. Yes. And it was dum dum dum. Oh my god. Yeah. And then we've casually got Magnus going, Oh yeah, by the way, just cut off a bit of his soul and put it into potion, yeah? Cool. Yeah, good. Yeah. Like it's nothing. Well like like you know how to do that. Like you know how to draw a basic summoning pentagram. Mm. And like we all do it all the time. Right. Like bits of soul everywhere. But this is kind of like standard warlock operating procedure. And the other thing that's weird and is explainable in episode, but of course you then have Lilith carve a bit of soul of Clary and Clary passing out in the middle of the woods mm-hmm. and not coming to until they've got her back to the house. Yeah. So clearly this isn't like a casual Ah, it's fine. It doesn't matter. And I think it's explainable in an episode because Lilith probably wasn't as delicate about it as mm, Magnus would have yeah, been. So yeah. that's fine. Also, that looked like quite a lot of soul. It did, didn't it? I mean, I don't know how big a soul is. I have no idea. Again, not enough information <laughs> on this. But, you know, maybe the whole thing was a little bit more traumatic than it needed to be. And it was done by a dragon rather than... A nice pretty warlock. Yes, after Clary had presumably expended some energy in the whole summoning of Mm. Ethereal thing. And it was done under, you know, stress and duress and fear rather than in a calm home environment. Yes. It's like a home birth or birth in the back of a cab. Also, maybe it's one of those things where if it's done cooperatively, Mm. it's no big deal. Yeah, yeah. You know, you can imagine the whole magic strength sharing thing might work similarly. Yeah, yeah. But, like, if it's just a kind of, yes, here you go, here is some of my strength, let me offer you my hand. Or you're actively taking someone's uh, strength. stealing somebody's, yeah. Yeah. Mm. That that might be a very different thing. But, yeah, I just feel we have an awful lot of jarring information and conflicting statements in the promo this scene the end scene yeah i think that's fair and on top of that magnus is dope right i just just magnus should be asking way more questions Mm. about this and the kind of dropping of ragnar's name should not be anywhere near enough to sort of make him feel comfortable with this so especially because surely that should make you more suspicious Magnus already goes, I thought I knew all the warlocks in New York. And she goes, I'm from out of town. Fine. But surely Magnus definitely knew all of Ragnar's friends. I mean, maybe not all of them. They were both quite old. You know, presumably they knew lots of people from all over the place. But it's certainly not anything that you can take to be reason to trust somebody. Because, Mm. you know, she has just named one of Magnus's best friends who happens to be dead and therefore completely incapable of, like, Confirming 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 or denying. Like, that's a little convenient, no? And also... He knows nothing about her. He doesn't know anything about this situation or what she's going to actually use this potion for. Mm. It's just like, what are you doing, man? What What are you doing? And she leaves without paying. Yes, kind of additionally, but like, I'm not sure he should be paid. He's, he's <laughs> being a numbskull. <laughs> Kind of just so we can draw back on it later. But so we're not just yelling. <laughs> Lilith says specifically that she needs to use this potion on her lover, who's a soldier, who's preoccupied so much with his feelings of love for her that he's incapable of doing his duty mm. and that she's worried about what the consequences will be. This is targeted and specific and suggests some kind of disturbing things about the information that 
that Lilith is able to pull from Jace. Does it? I think so. I think between Lilith knowing Ragnar's name, which, you know, Ragnar was previously the High Warlock of London, so mm. presumably he was not yeah. a small potato in the Warlock world. And Hodge knew about his association with Magnus right. kind of thing. That doesn't raise so many alarm bells for me. But this whole story about the soldier, that is targeted, that is specifically designed to pull on Magnus's heartstrings. Yes, or Lilith's just talking about the fact that he's her soldier and he's not doing his job. Because I almost thought that it was a little bit too on the nose in regards to Lilith and her, you know, what's going on Mm. in her life. Because I was kind of expecting her to pull this out so you can make the sob story work of going, he's a soldier and I'm really worried he's going to be distracted on the front line and, you know, get shot in the face kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. Except she then says and i'm worried he can't do his job properly and it's almost snotty i found that line quite unpleasant because i just thought oh you are such a selfish unpleasant person how is magnus not picking up on this but because she, he says but she doesn't say that he's going to be incapable of doing his job properly she says that she's worried about him being incapable of doing his duty mm. which is a very different thing there is nothing in what she says that implies that the duty he has is to her I mean, we know it is because we know she's talking about Jace. Mm. But there is nothing in what she says to Magnus that implies that this soldier's duty is to her. No, but to me, that's what I was inferring. But to Magnus, this is pretty much the most loaded thing she could have Mm. come up with. It just seems too convenient because she has no reason to tell him the truth. Yeah, yeah, You know, insofar as she does. Insofar as Jason needing him to have no feelings for his lover because she's worried that he won't be able to do his duty. There's no reason for her to tell him the truth. She could have said anything she liked. And they're like, she's evil. So she has no compunction about lying to him. Yeah. Because what I thought that she was going to try and convince Magnus with is that she needs someone to fall out of love with her because they're, you know, showing stalkerish, scary tendencies. Mm Mm-hmm that he was actually a, I need to protect myself from this person that thinks they are madly in love with me. Yeah. Because that's the only way I could have thought of her being able to convince him, a kind of threat to her life. I suppose the risk there, though, is that he'll either say, that's not love, that's obsession, therefore this thing won't Isn't gonna work, work. Mm. or let's call the authorities <laughs> and get let's that the person, you know, <laughs> you know, poor, nice warlock lady who's being, like, tormented, let's offer you assistance and mm. refuge. So it has to be a passive thing, it has to be something that's a sad sob story, and this, this is for everybody's own good, but this isn't actually, a, like, people's lives in danger. And But can you think of anything else other than a soldier on the firing line? Line, that would work i mean obviously you could have gone with police officer or yeah but i do think it needs to be a you're so in love you're distracted from your job and that puts you at peril because magnus then turns around and goes well i suppose in that case like unless this is a targeted story she has no reason to think that that's going to push his buttons but it's not about pushing buttons it's about reasoning with him yeah but it's not purely logical It's like, oh, somebody's so distracted because they're in love with someone that they might get shot at on the front line because they're a soldier. Like, there's no, there's no, like, intrinsic logic there. No. It has to chime with you. You have to have an emotional response for that to be, like, logical certainty. Because she could also have said, it's for me, I'm in love with this person who's married to someone else and they're really happy and I I can't get over it. Mm. You know, it's like, that might have been something that he'd sort of go, well, sounds like maybe you'd be better off moving on then. Yeah. Yeah. This is a story which may have worked for other people, but had a pretty good chance of working with Magnus because of who Magnus is and because of who Magnus is in relation to his partner. Yeah. Like, Don't, That's not necessarily something that just get it from Jace's brain. I'm not sure where else she'd be getting it from necessarily. The world? I think the world but knows. But which bit of the world? Like, she's not interacting with anybody else? Yeah, but she knew about Magnus. I suppose. And if she knows about Magnus, and surely she also knows he's dating the head of the New York Institute. I mean, I guess I'm assuming that she's drawing it out of Jace's brain just because she got the information about Clary from Jace's brain in the first place. So we also made that up because we couldn't think of anywhere else she got it from. This is going to be like the tracking. We're going to get stuck in this. <laughs> yeah. The point is, is that I feel very much, however she came about this information, Mm. that this is a very... It's a bit on the nose. That it's a very carefully targeted story to tell Magnus 
to get him to do this thing. Yeah. yeah and the, yeah. Lilith has kind of never been scarier than she is in this scene. Yeah, yeah. I'm just not entirely sure how much of that isn't just a writer's getting the theme across the episode. Maybe, though equally, Lilith is the evilest evil who's ever evil. so why wouldn't it be that she's manipulating him expertly? She's way scarier if she's able to use the information that she's gathered on Magnus by whatever means. Mm. No, no, I mean, I'm all down with a villain that's actually competent. Mm. Because... And she's certainly competent. In this episode, she exhibits yeah. great competency. And not scared to get her hands dirty. No. I like all of it. Because we've so far dealt with villains that led to our Shadowhunters being phenomenally stupid. Mm-hmm. Just so they could be cleverer. Yeah, yeah. And... Yeah, Magnus is a bit of a dope in this. But generally, Lilith is scary. Yes. And it's because she's clever. My main issue with Magnus being such a dope is that there's no real narrative reason for him to be a dope. Like, he could ask more questions and she could tell him more lies and spin a better thing. Yeah, he could ask more questions and she could be cleverer and get away with it. Yeah. Because that would make her scarier. Yeah, totally. Anyway, we're like nearly an hour in and (laughs) we've not got past the cold open yet, so we should probably move on. Magnus' dopiness aside, great cold open. It's a beautiful cold open and so contained and like isolated and kind of sets up the themes for the episode generally. Beautiful. So good. Does exactly the things that a cold open should do. And it's a very reasonable two and a half minutes or something. Yeah. Rather than, you know, 12. Yep. (laughs) So we come out of the credits to Jace and Clary in the Institute Courtyard. Jace is basically saying that his mother suffered alone with her illness for God knows how long Mm -hmm. and that she didn't seek help and he's not going to make that same mistake so he's going to go to the silent city to seek help as I think Alex suggested last week. Mm -hmm. Clary says, but if they find out that something's wrong with you, they're going to strip your runes and say you're unfit for duty. Yeah, I'm kind of terrified by the fact that apparently being unfit for duty means you're being de Yeah. dude. Yeah. Clary says that as an alternative, why don't they try and talk to the angel? Jay says you can't possibly risk raising Raziel again. And she says, what about Theriel? We have his blood. He has kind of reason to be nice to us. Mm. And Jay says, you know what? Fine. Do yeah. That. I really like that she thinks of raising the angel. It's a good idea. I mean, that's brilliant. It's a good idea. Yeah. And yeah. He might smite you and that would be awkward. Yeah. But yeah, totally. I like her idea. I like th- that she's working the problem so actively. Yeah. That she's completely acknowledging that he's got an issue. And yes, absolutely, he should have help with that issue. But let's make sure that it's the right help. Let's exhaust all possibilities before we do anything drastic. I like all of that. It all makes no, sense. Totally. It's all full of logic. And I really like that Jace textually says that, yeah, it didn't start until he was raised from the dead, but maybe it triggered it. Absolutely. It's Which is beautiful. kind of exactly what we were talking about last week. I love that he textualizes that. I like how sort of resigned Jace is in this scene, but how frightened he is also. Yeah. That you can really see that this whole thing is freaking him out, but that he can't see another way out and that I think he feels better for having decided on a course of action. Absolutely. Yeah, I think, again, like he says to Alec in the end, it's just at least this way he will have tried everything rather than just let this thing destroy him. Yeah, totally. Interesting that he says at the beginning that he's been benched. Hmm. Do we think that he's actually been benched or that he has sort of benched himself because he's behaving in an erratic way that's freaking him out? I think both is possible because the person who would bench him would be Alec, surely. Yes, I would have thought so. And maybe Alec can't get through to him about talking about his problems, so at least what he can do is not put him out on missions where he might get killed because he's not himself. Maybe, though Alec does say, I heard you took the day off today. Mm, True. Which again, Implying... it's run by Alec, but no. Except maybe the conversation was actually, look, maybe you should take some time. Maybe you should take it easy for a few days. And then Alec left it there. And then Jay's actually Jay's did. Jay's actually did. Yeah. You know, that, that could be that could be a sort of way in which mm. both those things would make sense. Yeah, but yeah. And just, maybe it's just he benched himself. Yes, yes. Because I can't think who else would have done so. Unless, I suppose, in the past couple of days, there's been push back from Clary to get him to chill out, stay at home, you disappeared, you're losing time, you're erratic, you know, let me take patrol this time and this time and this time and yeah, this time, yeah, yeah. which is possible. Clary working hard. Yeah. yeah, yeah, very much so. We cut over to Magnus's loft. Magnus is rifling through a box of trinkets, of mementos. He picks up a kind of talisman-looking thing. Yeah, kind of a witchy thing. 
Alec enters, asks if he's okay. Magnus says, yes, he's just tidying up. He hides the box. Hides the box. He puts the box under a pile of books on a bookshelf, completely visible to anybody who happens to be walking past the bookshelf. If you put a tail on him, he'd be as cunning as a fox. (laughs) Alec asks why he's not tidying up with a snap of his fingers. Nice echo to Mm -hmm. shampoo scenes in which Alec wondered why he didn't wash his hair with a click of the fingers. The answer is ultimately the same. Yeah. Sometimes it's fun to tidy. Yeah. And also, stop calling your boyfriend the lazy git. <laughs> Magnus says that he supposes he's just odd like that. Alec says he's odd in a lot of ways. He does. Magnus at this point realises that Alec is wearing one of his shirts. And has been fiddling with the sleeves for the entire scene. Yes. It's quite ostentatiously wearing yeah. one of Magnus's shirts. <laughs> Alec asks slightly insecurely if it's not his style. Magnus says it's not your sleeve length. Mm-hmm. Fixes the sleeves. Alec then says, wouldn't it be nice if he had one of his own shirts? And Magnus does the most (laughs) elaborate... He is so extra. What is he doing? I think he's not only making the shirt, I think he is making the caterpillars that are weaving the silk that will go into the shirt. That's what it looks like. It looks like he's growing a grove of mulberry plants (laughs) in order to populate them with silkworms, in order to harvest the silk that they then... So extra. My God. I love it. I don't know what this is about. No. Like, in the moment, it's fun and it's funny. But sort of textually, I have absolutely no idea what this is about. Well, especially because he literally just clicked his fingers to make his sleeves longer. Yes. And obviously, that's fairly easy. Yes. Like, you're making something that's right in front of you a little bit longer. And bloody blah. And I don't know, in my head, there's a bit of him trying to get through his own war to the Institute so he can get to Alex room okay. in the institute okay maybe so there's a kind of layers to what he has to do yeah i mean we did talk about this not very long ago as well in the how does the summoning objects mm. thing actually work because we did conclude that it was harder work because the only time we've actually seen him do it has been with alex stelle where he needed actual visual contact because he didn't know where alex stelle was and the Cape Cod dinner, which we kind of assumed he'd had set up somewhere mm-hmm. exactly as it appeared in Alex's office. So he had very clear visualisation either way. And so, wine glasses from over there to in right, your hand. Exactly. Whilst I have absolutely no difficulty with the idea that he knows exactly where Alex's bedroom is in the Institute and where in Alex's bedroom Alex's dresser is and where in Alex's dresser Alex's shirts are, it does seem a kind of involved process. Yes. And he does say, I think I can manage this. Yeah. And then builds up to this huge bit of magic. Yes. But mostly it's fun. Mostly it's fun. Alex says, no, 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 that's not what I meant. You don't have to chill. Do that. Chill, chill out. dude. Stop it. And then I start to have to watch this scene through my fingers. Did it make you a little bit... It, it made me kind of curl up a, a little bit in a in a ball of abnormal insecurity. Just a little bit. Anxiety and death. Yeah, we'll come round to that thing. Because <laughs> Alex says, wouldn't it be nice if we lived together? And Magnus says, it would be nice in eight to ten years. And yeah. <laughs> Alex says, oh, that's kind of the, the gist of it. I mean, mostly Alex says, wouldn't it be nice if I had my shirt? And Magnus tries to get him his shirt. And then he goes, no, 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 no. I just meant if my shirt was here. Yeah. And Magnus looks at him blankly. It's like... If my shirt and my stuff and all of my things and me were here yeah. with you yeah. in the flat, yeah. it is very, very much... Wouldn't it be nice if we lived together and you understood what I was saying yes. from friends? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Now, the reason why this sends me into something of a anxiety mess... Alex's lack of self-preservation? Yeah, mm. yeah, totally. There's some interesting things we'll get to in a minute, I'm sure, about the way in which Alec approaches this conversation and how it's similar and dissimilar from how he's approached things in the past. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, he has no doubt in his mind that Magnus is going to say yes. Yeah. He has no hesitation and no wobble about the fact that Magnus is going to say yes. So he comes into this thing not just assured of the answer, but a little cocky about it. Yeah, he's kind of being coy with the question, which I think you could read as insecurity, but I think it's more he just doesn't know how people ask this thing. Yes. You know, he knew that you tell someone, I love you, when you love them. Yes. But I think he hasn't quite worked out how people normally approach the, can I live in your house? Well, this is not dissimilar 
from him not actually articulating that I want to have sex with you thing yeah. in 207. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Back then, in 207, he had no real lack of confidence about the approach. You know, we talked about... And the end result. About possible insecurities and kind of a build-up of anxiety before then. But in the actual scene, in the moment, yeah. he has no hesitation and possibly a little bit, like, overly confident. Yeah, like, no hesitation and no chill. In his approach to the actual, let's get it on, yeah. kind of thing. And he's similar now that I absolutely believe that this is a thing that he's been building up into his head and that he may have been insecure or anxious about beforehand if this is something that he's been percolating on for a while mm-hmm, mm-hmm. then there may have been anxiety associated with the thought process that happened beforehand but actually but right now, in the moment he's done that Alec Lightwood thing he's steal his spine and he's just sort of jumped into it and he's really worked for him in the past it has and the fact that it doesn't now is kind of painful because he's holding nothing back because yeah. he's not protecting himself at all yeah, yeah yeah because he's not asking the question the way you ask a question when you're not sure of the answer he's asking a question in the way that you ask a question when you're positive of the answer yeah Alec Lightwood really doesn't believe in any way in plausible deniability no no he or has havering no or return from this no or arriving at a conclusion that's maybe a little bit of a compromise mm-hmm, like there's mm-hmm. nothing in his approach to this conversation that allows magnus any room to go maybe yeah 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 you know and that kind of sends me into a little bit of an anxiety fueled mm. mess to be honest and him and it stumps alec you know it, it stops him kind of he changes and there's a really beautiful thing that happens in matt's performance at the point at which Magnus says no, mm-hmm. ultimately. Mm-hmm. There's a really beautiful shift in his person because it's it's very subtle. You know, he doesn't move. He doesn't have the line particularly. His entire tone, every bit of his body has shifted, has changed. Mm. Well, I think just before that, there's a really interesting moment where he does a slightly jokey bad idea and Magnus says, no, it's a wonderful idea. And Mafia's face is so interesting yeah. because... He doesn't beam at him because it's a wonderful idea, therefore we're going to do that. He kind of frowns because whether subconsciously or consciously, he can tell that Magnus's tone is off. Yeah. And then there's this really, really small, hesitant smile because he did say it's a wonderful idea. Yeah. And then Magnus says no. Yeah. And then everything about him just drops. Yeah. I think we also have a situation, and it's a situation we've had with Alec before, in which he is a person who says what he thinks and means what he says. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And he expects everyone else to do the same. And he now knows, academically, I suppose, that Magnus isn't like that. Yeah. But it's still not a read of people, a read of kind of interactions that comes naturally to him. Mm. He's having to learn how to read subtext in the course of his relationship with Magnus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And of course, we've had the scene in 301 in which that was reaffirmed for us that Magnus isn't like that. But then we also concluded that with both of them saying, we have to do this communication thing. Yes. And Magnus promising that he would. Yes. Which, again, I think is where a lot of Alex's hesitation is coming from. Yeah, totally. So, well, you're saying it's a wonderful idea, but you're not seeming like it is. Yeah. And now you're saying no, but you're kind of not giving me anything. Yeah, yeah, totally. I mean, there's so much stuff going on in the scene. And one of the things is all of the echoes you get to previous stuff between the two of them. Yeah, absolutely. Which is kind of throwing me for a loop a little bit, to be mm-hmm. honest, just because there is there are so many layers to this. Because you pointed out that Matthew's choice of delivery and voice, as it were, yeah. is really reminiscent of 207. In in his initial approach to the conversation, his tone reminded me very much of the 207 scene. That kind of slight overconfidence. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And then, of course, we've also got Magnus going, I oh, things would change, and Alec going, yes, we'd get closer together, and Magnus going, no such thing. Yeah. And, you know, what he's saying is that no such thing because we are already as close as we can be. Yes. He's completely dismissing this notion that they need to move in together to get closer, which is nonsense. We'll come back to it. Yeah. Hold that face. (laughs) (laughs) But he says no such thing in exactly the same way he said no such thing in the 218, 207 flashback. Absolutely. In regards to am I doing something wrong? No such thing. And it's casual, it's throwaway. And Alec wasn't doing anything wrong in that scene. Yeah. 
Which is quite interesting because right here, you know, Alec's still not doing anything wrong, but he's trying to take the relationship somewhere where Magnus isn't comfortable. Yes. So yes. Know, he is doing something wrong. Yeah. For the two of them. Yeah, yeah, I suppose so, yeah. And I just think those layers are fascinating. Yes, absolutely. So Magnus says no such thing, as in there is no such thing as being closer than we are now. Mm. Except that is completely contrary to everything else he's saying in the scene. Everything else he's saying in the scene is that our relationship would change if we lived together, that we've been together for only a short amount of time. Kind of the inference being we don't know each other that well yet. We're still getting to know each other. We're still becoming comfortable with each other. We're still getting closer. And you might be spending every night here, but you also have the option of not. If we move in together, you live here. All of which is sound and I'm on side with that thought process. Oh yeah, totally. Totally. You know, I think it's too soon for them to live Mm -hmm. together. I'm Mm -hmm. totally on board with that. But saying there's no such thing in the way he does is nonsense. Yeah. And And really not helping Alec with, you know, actually giving him reasoning that he can understand and straight talk. And it's confusing nonsense. And I get that what he's trying to do is say we're together now and we're really close and that's really great and I don't want you to think that we need to be doing anything in order to be doing this right. Yeah, what he's saying you know, is we're close, we love each other, we're in a really good place. We don't need to push for anything more right, right now. Right, which is all fine, except mm. that's not what he says. He yeah. says there's no such thing as closer than this, which isn't true. Yeah, There's miles to go in terms of intimacy and knowledge of each other and closeness. And as we talked about, morning afters aren't the same as living together and seeing each other any time of the day totally in any state of vulnerability totally and that is what changes when you live together that is one of the big things and quite often is what breaks couples up yep because suddenly you're seeing this person in all of the hours of the day and some of them you might not like you see all of their habits you see all of their bad sides as well as their good sides which is what you normally try and show people but when you live together you kind of can't avoid the other sides And I do think a lot of this is just still the fact that Magnus has some of his walls still up and Alec Lightwood has no walls. Yeah, that completely. I think also Alec is in a position within his relationship with Magnus, but also comes from a world wherein the things that you want and the things that you love are things that you have to hold on to really tight because you might lose them at any moment. And people die a lot. His people die young and frequently. Mm. And... In addition to that, Magnus left him not very long ago. Yeah. You know, I... That must still be echoing. Absolutely. It has to be. And I completely understand why Alec is pushing for solidity, is pushing for not wasting any time, especially if one of the things that's knocking around in his head at the moment is that his time is limited, mm. which, you know, by their later conversation is very much something that's that's with him. Yeah. You know, even at this point before he's looked in the box, before he's had that realisation, I guess, which obviously crystallises it for him. Absolutely. But... And certainly even before then, you know, the things that are going on with Jace at the moment mm-hmm. and the fact that Jace might lose his position, you know, his job at any minute, even if he's not dying, yep. that, you know, things are very transient i suppose yes absolutely and the fact that we're now up to 28 mundanes killed Mm -hmm. 26 i think but yes just over the last couple of days you know all of that must be bringing mortality home to you yes in a way that isn't just about dating an immortal yeah or the fact that you're a soldier just the fact that life is very very brief yes Yes, absolutely. And we talked last week about the way in which Alec was clearly flailing because of all of the things that were changing and because of all of the Mm -hmm. ground that was moving under him, you know, that he was... Unlike Adrena, he's not wearing comfortable shoes. Right. No, it's like you completely get both of their perspectives here and what they're not doing is talking about it. Yeah, totally. There's a couple of things that I kind of wanted to pick out, I guess. Part of what we're getting is a slight... It's not a reset or a backpedal because that implies it's sort of reneging on something that we'd Mm -hmm, mm pre-established. But we're getting a real sense from Magnus in this episode that he loves Alec, absolutely, and that he's 100% in this relationship right now. But that at the moment, Alec is to him the most recent in a long line of lovers. 
Yep. That doesn't mean that he loves him any less and that doesn't mean that he's replaceable or any of those things. But what we're not getting from Magnus at all in this episode is any implication that they're soulmates or destined to be. That or they're special, that yeah. That they're special beyond the individuals involved and that mm-hmm. they love one another and that's always special. He makes quite a point of saying that they love one another and that they're here and this moment is wonderful and this moment is something that they should hold on to and cherish. What he's not saying is we have a love to end all loves and it's mm. changing the world and it is changing me forever and I will never recover from this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's something he's not saying. I will never love again. Right. Yeah. There are no big dramatic statements from Magnus at the moment. This is a very, you know, forgive the pun, a very mundane kind of love story mm-hmm, for him mm-hmm. at the moment. And that's interesting. I'm interested that that's where he is with this. Yeah. And I don't know how much of that from Magnus is keeping that wall up, is obfuscating. And how much of that is just having been confronted with this scary let's move in together in a moment of nostalgia. Right. And how much of that is an awareness that they've been together for two months and that that's nothing in He's the grand actually team. said it now. We well, can't right. get around that. And that if nothing else, Alex really young. Even if Magnus wasn't a warlock, <laughs> you know, even if Magnus at this point was actually 30, mm. Alex, like 22 years old, this is his first relationship. Things are changing for him all the time and you cannot bank on people feeling the same always as they do right now yeah. especially when they're young and inexperienced you know it's one of the things that i think this episode is doing beautifully show alex age mm-hmm. and not in a he's making mistakes he's being stupid he's being childish right but just genuinely he's young yeah and he's making calls that someone that age would make because they haven't been heard because they haven't experienced that stuff yes. because you know they haven't had to recover from things like that magnus is his first love and in alex's head as you know i'm sure we all did with our first love he's going to be his only love yes and maybe that's true yeah but at the same time he hasn't gone through the bit where turns out it's not the case yes and he hasn't got anything to compare it to and that certainly to magnus must be really really prominent it must be something that for his own sake magnus has to be really keeping in mind yeah. all the time because presumably magnus has had several loves in the past who he's thought were going to be going to be the love that would break all loves mm. and he's been wrong every time so far well to be fair no not necessarily it's just they died well Yes, necessarily. When he first meets Alec, he says, you've opened up something in me. Mm -hmm. You've changed Mm -hmm. me. You have opened me up to the idea of loving again in a way I never thought I would. You know, he thought he was done. He thought that he was closed off, that his heart was shuttered, Mm. that he had run his course in terms of feeling that way. And Alec changed things for him. So he has been wrong because he's found love again and again and again and again after losing it after Mm. thinking i've lost this person who meant so much to me and i'm never gonna love again and then somebody else came along and changed his mind and alec has done that yeah yeah textually alec has done that Mm. for him yeah it doesn't mean he loved any of those people any less no but but he thought just as with alec yeah at the moment it doesn't mean he's not gonna love again right and who would want him to I mean, I know that at the moment in this episode, Alex frustrated and angry and sad and he doesn't understand. But once you come out of that, once you kind of face the fact that one of you is immortal and one of you is mortal, who would want to condemn Magnus to a life of, you're now dead and that's it for me and I'm never going to... Oh, oh, for sure. Open myself up to anything ever again. I'm oh, never going to feel anything ever again. For sure. And truly, this isn't something that Alex going to want. No, certainly not. But kind of the point is that neither Alec nor Magnus get a choice in that. No. Or no. Or can make any decisions about right. it. Because, yeah, as you say, Magnus, Magnus fought that thought last time. he was done. Yeah. And, and then, then he wasn't. Someone came along and surprised him. And there's nothing saying that that's not exactly how it will go in the future. Mm. Or not how it will go in the future. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe there's no going back from this. But maybe not. And yeah. I think all Magnus is thinking in this... And I think failing to articulate properly, which is interesting within the context of the scene, is that he has to hold on to that because he doesn't have a choice. Mm, yeah. So I find that interesting. I find that kind of lack of big soulmatey type declarations 
interesting mm. in this episode generally, in this scene specifically. And of course, the other thing that we need to talk about is how the scene ends. So we kind of have to reset this conversation a little bit. So Lilith comes to Magnus's flat at, let's say, nine o'clock in the morning. Sure. Early morning. Yeah. Alec is asleep in the bedroom next door. Which because... is suddenly adds a level of creepy and malevolent to that whole scene. Oh, like, yeah. I don't want Lilith anywhere near Alec in a vulnerable, asleep kind of a state. Well, like... I also really don't want Lilith anywhere near Magnus in a scene that might have ended up with her doing bad things to Magnus with Alec oblivious asleep next door. I mean, just the horrors that just, that whole thing opens up is Jesus. hideous. All bad. But that's what's going on. So Alec is getting dressed to go to work right now and is throwing what he doesn't realise is a big bomb at Magnus, but is kind of literally on both of their way out the door to work. Yeah. And of course, Alec doesn't realise it's a big deal. And... Magnus has a client. He has to leave because yes. that's his job. And we see him with the mass amount of cash later on and someone has to pay for his penthouse. <laughs> so that's fine. But he kind of he kind of dismisses this. Yeah. And it's not like Alex being subtle about the fact that he's confused and hurt and he doesn't understand why Magnus is saying no and he's not happy. Yeah. They haven't come to a conclusion over this. Alec hasn't gone, yes, I completely understand your reasoning and I was wrong to ask you. He's unhappy. Mm-hmm. And Magnus is going, I need to go talk to you tonight. And he leaves. Yeah. A lot of that, I think, harks back to what we've talked about with Magnus before, is that he does avoid conflict. He does avoid conflict. And that's sort of fine within the context of the scene given that he's on his way out and all of that i think one of the things i kind of feel about the way in which he exits this conversation is that he's sort of avoiding compassion as well like Mm -hmm. he's kind of avoiding empathizing and offering alec any solace or comfort i mean he there's no implication from magnus at the end that they'll come back later tonight and they'll have a proper talk about it and they'll sort all of this out Mm. you know there's no comfort implicit in his tone no because i think his talk to you tonight is very much a you're going to be here for dinner i'll see you later it's very casual i don't think it's a i'll talk to you tonight at which point we will get to the bottom of this i don't get any sense Mm. from magnus that they're going to continue this conversation as far as he's concerned anyway and i think most of that honestly is in the delivery like i think you could deliver the line i'll talk to you tonight with a sense of concern and awareness of hurt yeah yeah, yeah. and well and certainly a higher awareness of are you actually going to be here tonight yeah or yeah. have I scared you away? Am I going to find you on another rooftop or beating a punching bag? Right. You know, he could have said, I'll talk to you tonight and have that mean, are you going to be OK until then? Yeah. And that's not what he says. He says, I'll talk to you tonight. Yeah. Like, later we will continue to converse because you will be here and I will also be here and we will drink martinis and eat steak. Well, like, it all feels a little bit force jolly because he's also doing the little wave with the book as he right, leaves yeah. which is all very quirky and jolly and forced happiness yeah it it just feels like alec could have used a little more sugar coating or that magnus could have thrown him a bone mm. or something that he could have cushioned the blow a little bit it's also like alec started off this conversation with wanting one of his shirts give him a drawer well yeah kind of you know Give him something, you know, like... As I say, maybe it's a little bit early for us to, you know, move in together properly, but how about I clear out half of my wardrobe? Or if you're Magnus Bain, how about I give you a shoebox for your clothes? (laughs) But, you know, yeah, literally olive branch. Yes. Just, I think, some acknowledgement that this was, firstly, a tough thing to ask, Mm. that there's an implicit, like, Bravery about it, yeah. ...in the asking of the question, and a natural hurt disappointment in being turned down. Yeah. You know, I don't think Magnus is in the wrong, but I think it's fascinating where Magnus is Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and will obviously continue this through to the next couple of scenes and it's going to become a lot clearer in the later scenes, I think. But he's in a really interesting place right now. He is. It's kind of not a place that I expected him to be in regard to this conversation Mm -hmm. because I thought he was fairly certain he was going to say no. Yeah. I'm kind of amazed by the amount of 
shock horror outrage that we've had because he did because surely that's a story you're telling and also you put that teaser out if the answer was yes then that's anticlimactic yes and doesn't lead to anything yes so obviously the answer was no in my head anyway yeah for me too i mean i think there's also a kind of narrative pacing thing you tend to do with with romance stories that you don't give away something like a moving in together moment Mm. four episodes into yeah yeah yeah. a season you know what i mean it's like they've got a long way to go and only so many milestones that they can hit you want to pace them out a little bit more carefully than that but this wasn't where i expected magnus to be in regards to that no yeah it's a really interesting scene i'm fascinated by the echoes to 207 to their first time sequence if you count 207 and the 218 flashback which was also 207 yeah right well especially because that was your first big milestone yeah and it all went really well this is kind of your next one and it's not going as planned yeah yeah but also then of course off the back of 218 which is 207 and we have to bear that in mind but off the back of 218 they also broke up yeah so just layers and layers and layers this is this is a whole basket of onions it is yeah absolutely moving on moving on we cut over to the Hunter's Moon. Simon is having an argument with one of the bar staff about a gig he clearly had planned and then was cancelled. Simon's also a dope. Simon is also a dope. It's like, <laughs> this gig has been cancelled by somebody claiming to be my manager, who wasn't my manager, mm. but was claiming to be my manager. You have cancelled that gig, Julie, as requested. Pay me anyway. No! No! Absolutely <laughs> not! What's wrong with you? <laughs> he encounters Jace, who's day drinking. Yep. By himself. Yep. At a bar. Jace is in a healthy place then. At least he's at a bar. He could be in a, you know, gutter. I suppose that's true. Yes. Silver lining? Well, not rock bottom. Yeah. 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 Okay. Jace is very, very clearly trying to avoid all of the issues going on in his life. So asks Simon about the issues going on in Simon's life. He's going to fix Simon. It's fine. Yeah. It's such obvious, like, preoccupation that Mm. I kind of love it. It's kind of beautiful. I love the entire arc with Jace and Simon in his episode. Yeah. It's wonderful. It's really, really nicely done. But I also really like the bit where I can see Jace not just wanting to avoid his problems, but also looking at Simon and thinking, well, how difficult can your life be (laughs) like surely i can fix that in the next couple of hours yeah it's beautiful yeah totally and i love it when he asks simon what's going on and simon kind of goes oh you wouldn't want to hear it it's a long story and the look on dom's face that's just as fed up literally saying don't make me ask twice yeah i already asked you i don't actually care just tell me yeah it is fabulous i wanted to talk a little bit about Jason and Simon's sort of dynamic, which has been an ongoing thing. Mm-hmm. You know, this is a dynamic that they set up back in season one and has kind of been continuous. You know, they've yeah. obviously warmed up on each other a little bit. There's a kind of trust between them, yep. I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Even if there's not actual affection. And there's quite clear reluctant admiration for what the other person is doing or has you know, right. gone through and dealt with and all of that. Yeah. We're now at a point where... Simon's way better at sniping back. He's always been quite feisty with Jace. Mm. You know, we have to remember back in season one where he did, you know, threaten Jace with physical violence. And, you know, slapped his arm and hurt his hand. For instance. And that's season one, episode two. Right. You know, that was right This is all early on. Simon has never been shy about giving it back. And whilst Jace has always been you know, nasty to him. He's bullied Mm. Simon. There is a give and take. There is a banter and there is a mutual ribbing of each other. It's not affectionate in any way, but it is their rhythm. You know, it is something that neither of them are made uncomfortable by. I think Mm -hmm, it's safe mm -hmm. to say. I think Jace does not scare Simon in the slightest. And the fact that Jace is mean to him doesn't bother Simon in the slightest. And I think that's quite important because Jace does continue to be an arse to him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it is ostentatiously an arse to him. Absolutely. Yeah. Jace's behaviour towards Simon is not okay. But it doesn't bother Simon. Mm. Maybe it should bother Simon. Yes, possibly. But it doesn't. Absolutely, but it doesn't. But it doesn't. But there's also the bit, you know, how far has Simon come? You know, compare this bar scene to back in 2 whatever it was, where Jace was trying to teach him how to pick up girls. 207. Oh, well done, you. Hmm. I've talked about that a lot today. <laughs> Look at all of the other harkbacks to 207 in his yeah. episode. Yeah. Nice theme. But, you know, how different is this Simon from that Simon? Yes. 
he's come such a long way and he's taken charge of his life, but it starts here, where you just realise the last time they were in a bar together, he really, really wasn't in charge of what was going on. Yes. He's just got so much more control in his conversation with Jace this yes. time round. Yes. It it's has really to, nice to see. It is nice to see, though it has to be said that Jace is also starting from a weaker yes. place. Yeah, of, of course. You know, they're, they're, the balance in this conversation mm. has shifted dramatically. They are both in very different places to where they were before. Yeah, which is interesting in regards to the same conversation we had over the four-way date. Yes. And how... Jay's was in such a different position in regards yeah, to Simon totally. than he has been in the past. Totally. Interesting things. Yeah. Simon tells Jace all of his woes. Encourages him to take a swing for Encur- good measure. He, right. <laughs> and Jace looks shockingly unfazed by the whole I've got a rune thing on my forehead that the Seedy Queen put there and throws people who try and hit me across rooms. Jace came back from the dead. I, I suppose. Yeah. Perspective, perspective. But yeah, after threatening to put each other in traction, all in good fun, <laughs> haha, jolly boy japes, Jace says that he's kind of going to help. And Simon says, why on earth do you care? And Jace says, I don't care. Clary cares. Yeah. And you sort of go, really? Really? Has this got anything to do with Clary? Really? Because I'm looking at that one with a deeply sceptical eyebrow. Well, I mean, it's a good enough excuse to give Simon. No, no, sure. I totally, well. totally am on board with Jace giving him the line. Yeah. But, like, that's not anything to do with this. This has yeah. nothing to do with Clary whatsoever. I think he thinks this is a problem he can solve in two hours. Yeah. It's going to make him feel I good totally, about himself. I totally agree. Yeah. I think this is seeking catharsis. This yeah. is seeking problems he can solve. Because he can't fix his problems. Yeah. He's seeking his own competency, which is something yeah. we've talked about before, but it's really great to see any character actively seeking their mm. own competency. And he shows a lot of competence yes. in this episode. Yeah, he's, he's really great. smart in this episode. Yeah. I really like it in this episode. Yeah. We cut out to Isabel, who's in Clary's room, rummaging through her wardrobe on the phone to Clary, asking if she can borrow a dress for her date with Charlie. Which is a rude thing to do once you've already gone halfway through her closet it is rude i'm also not entirely sure what izzy means by mundane dress like i'm not sure what's not mundane about any of her kind of like pencil wiggle dressy type things they all seem perfectly like normal clothing to me yeah you say that and yeah suddenly it seems like a setup i totally bought it when i watched it this morning (laughs) i was like yeah your dresses are a little bit weird and too risque and too short and all of them have got rivets on and chains and leather and yeah i I totally bought it yeah it makes sense now you pointed out but i totally bought it yeah no makes no sense to me whatsoever but otherwise she can't smell like clary i do appreciate that (laughs) i think it's interesting not to make every conversation we have about alec but i think it's interesting (laughs) that we have isabel borrowing clary's clothing in the same episode we get Alec borrowing Magnus's clothing. Yeah, to be fair, I mean, that conversation isn't about Alec. That conversation is about Clizzy Shippers. It is. Who are currently punching the air. It, but yes, but I mean, and congratulations to all of you. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I think there's something sort of interesting that the show is saying about intimacy mm. yeah, yeah, in yeah. these two things being existing in the same in the same episode. I mean, obviously, they've kind of been setting Clary and Isabel up as like sister besties yeah. for for a while now sort of or girlfriends don't take it away you <laughs> Sorry, give them, you take I, it away I don't, I don't mean to rain on the ship parade but um i think whatever the source of that intimacy it's very much something the show is actively courting yeah that sort of intimacy between absolutely clary and isabel and i think is establishing a closer friendship between them than actually existed before there's that there's <laughs> yeah. some of that slight time cheating thing again that there's a kind of oh they've always been besties it's like well they haven't they really haven't yeah but kind the time of cheating thing that magnus really ruined earlier uh, right um but that's okay we can roll with it and i just thought it was or a, ignore it or ignore it yeah. <laughs> but i just thought it was an interesting juxtaposition to have within this episode yeah absolutely i mean obviously there's something slightly odd about comparing your otp couple malik to this wonderful sister like friendship and making it quite such an ostentatious comparison but there is something beautiful in the intimacy of casually going through someone else's cupboard totally and picking up their clothes and wearing them and i think that works for both married couples and best friends yeah 
And I'm just because we have two instances of it in this episode, cycling back over instances we've had of it before. We had Clary wearing Jace's shirt in... Mm -hmm. Because hers was covered in ichor. Right. (laughs) In the uh, first or second episode. Yeah. We then had Clary wearing Isabel's clothing to go to the party. We had... And to meet Simon outside when she took off Jace's shirt. Right. We had Simon wearing Raphael's clothing to the wedding. Mm Mm-hmm. We've had Maya wearing Simon's Rock Solid Panda t-shirt. When she was naked after wolfing out. Yes. We've also recently had Heidi doing weird, sinister, sniffy things to Simon's clothing, which I think does kind of double down on this idea that other people's clothing is quite an intimate Mm. thing. That it speaks of closeness. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, obviously we don't want to read too much into this. Like, I'm not suggesting that, you know, Maya wearing Simon's Rock Solid Panda t-shirt after she'd wolfed out and torn apart her own clothing was indicative of some deep intimacy between them in the same way that the familiarity of Isabel going through Clary's wardrobe is, speaking of yeah. familiarity, you know, there's a, a domestic thing going on there as well. But I think it, I think it is interesting. Yeah, no, Absolutely. And just because we are back on the clothing, and we didn't actually call it out earlier, there's so many points to the show for going for sleeve length. Oh, yeah, yeah. In the controversy over Magnus's shirt not fitting. Alec, well done show. Yes, well done yep. show indeed, yeah. No conflict or... Uh, drama. Drama or, there yeah, whatsoever. All of yeah. that. No, very nice. All right, back to Izzy. So Izzy's very hesitant about this date, she thinks maybe she should cancel and go back to helping with the owl search. Clary says, no, 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 you've been working really hard. You deserve a day off. You should totally go. Which now means that both Izzy and Jace are not working. Yeah, I mean, I, I suppose there are other shadow hunters. They, yeah, and they talk now and they do stuff. They open floor safes. <laughs> they push buttons. Push buttons. It's great. Yeah, yeah. Later on, they'll be gay in an office. They will, yeah. Spoilers. <laughs> We cut over to Clary, who's visiting Luke at the police station. And Luke tells us about the um, cult that is brainwashing people to kill their loved ones. Yeah. It's such a beautifully human way of explaining this. Yeah, yeah. He says that we have something like 26 victims now, which does suggest a slight time passage thing. I don't know when we were told there had been 11 victims. Jace told us at some point, but I can't remember when exactly that was. Well, Alec also says to Magnus, there's been blah many Mondays. Blah many Mondays murdered. And I can't remember the number, but he does give us a number. And yeah, I think it was in the lower teens. Yeah. Yeah, no, I I can't remember specifically, but it does suggest that we've had at least a little bit of time pass for Mm. there to have been, you know, 10 additional murders at least. Especially because Lilith's been really busy going to Magnus's house. Yeah. And then Clary tells Luke. Yes. Finally. Yes. And weren't we right that Luke was exactly the right person oh, to absolutely. tell? He's yes. great. Clary says that um, Jace didn't just get wounded on the shore of Lake Lynn, that he died and came back, and that he hasn't been right since she brought him back. Clary says that she's been lying to everyone, that she's been lying to Alex, she's been lying to Izzy, she's been mm. lying to everybody. Interesting and, I mean, I suppose completely natural that she mentions Alec and Isabel by name, but yeah. nice in terms of the fact that we have seen her textually lie to them several times Absolutely. in the past few episodes and that she's had a conversation with Alec, at least, about the fact that she's lying at least two, if not three times yeah, this I think season three so was, far. Yeah. I like the kind of actually calling out that those conversations have been weighing on her somewhat. Yeah. You know, this is consistent, that she's quite honest. Mm-hmm, you know, mm-hmm. sort of like, Clary's always been manipulative, but quite honest. Yeah, about... she's not big on secrecy. No. Yeah. And I really like how distraught she is by it. And yes. Kat's doing a wonderful job yes, here. Yes, it's a really lovely scene. And I really like the kind of double thing that's going on in this scene, which is that she has a very practical purpose in telling Luke that she needs to see Clear first, who can help her talk mm-hmm, to Ethereal, mm-hmm. which makes perfect sense. Yeah. And is a solid step two of the plan that she outlined to Jace earlier. But there's also wanting to tell your dad. Yeah, that absolutely. Everything's gone wrong and you're really frightened. And it works absolutely on both levels. Yeah, the fact that she tells Luke isn't a surprise. It's not a secret. If that phone call from Molly hadn't come in, she would have told him in episode one. Yeah, totally. It's kind of surprising that she's waited this long since that point to, yeah. to come back round to telling him. And that's only been because she's been trying to... You know, support Jace. Yes. Luke takes this all quite well. Yeah. I really like his level of surprise. Yeah. I think if we got that same level of surprise from Alec when he finds out, it would be a bit weird because 
It should be a moment of going, oh, duh, rather yeah. than surprise. But for Luke, it's perfectly yeah. fine. So I like the level of shock and then how immediately pragmatic he is about it. Yes, totally. Luke ultimately agrees to take her to see Cleavis. Yep. We cut over to Lilith, who's summoning a demon... I like how unfamiliar she looks with this way of doing things. There's something yeah. that sort of suggests this isn't natural to her. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I don't know why she's doing it this way particularly. Because you have to sort of think this big, scary, queen of demon, dragon lady thing must have simpler and more obvious ways of summoning demons mm. to her. So it's interesting that she's using a very warlocky type way. Maybe this is just how Vicky Howe taught her to summon the soul sliver slicing demon. Right, maybe. Yeah. Maybe she's like that one specific one. This is like, well, in for a penny. Yeah, but she doesn't look entirely comfortable with the kind no. of process. She tells the demon to bring her back a sliver of Clary's soul, offers the demon a jacket of Clary's to sniff to get her scent. I don't know where she got the jacket. No. And I can't quite work out whether it's a jacket that we've seen Clary wear at some point in the season so far and mm. that she's lost so- at some point. Or whether it's just a random piece of or clothing that they had clothing, you know, yeah. lying around on set. I mean, obviously, whatever the clothing is, Jace could have nicked it for her from the Institute, so it's not like a huge yeah. deal anyway. But no, it was a really simple head cannon. We cut over to Kyle in Simon and Kyle's flat. Hi, best boyfriend. <laughs> Jace knocks on the door demands to know who Kyle is which given that he's knocking on his door is a little bit rich banter 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 he invites himself in and Kyle excuses himself to the shop very politely asks if either of them would like anything yeah. and then Jace goes and touches all of the stuff <laughs> Jace goes and touches all of the stuff Jace <laughs> says that he's gone to talk to Luke's pack and whilst they are angry as all get out with Simon yeah. it wasn't them who cancelled the gig Simon says oh he's appreciative of all the help but really he'd prefer if Jace stopped helping now and couldn't they just play some video games yeah (laughs) old school Mortal Kombat is what Simon wants to play (laughs) which is about as perfect as it possibly could be I love Mortal Kombat that was like one of the very few games I really got into (laughs) I love that one yeah old school Jace asks if all the stuff in the flat is Simon's and Simon says no no no, it's all Kyle's this is like the perfect apartment for me and Jace says yeah it is isn't it I love how smart he is in this sequence yeah No, literally all of this is good. It's just great. I like that he clearly left Simon at the bar and went to investigate. Straight away. That he's been keeping himself busy with this. Mm -hmm. Like, as we say, this is catharsis, but it's also busy work. This is also, like, legwork, and I'm going to investigate. I'm going to walk to the Jade Wolf and ask them, and then I'm going to walk back, and I'm going to talk to Simon about it, and then I'm going to walk somewhere else, and I'm going to be busy doing all sorts of things. He will have walked across the Brooklyn Bridge again three times. (laughs) Possibly, yeah. We cut over to Alec, who's still at the loft. He's talking to Izzy on the phone. He's been clearly reading about possession in Magnus's library, hasn't been able to find anything. He's wandering through the lobby bit of Magnus's loft and spots the box under the books where Magnus ingeniously hid it <laughs> earlier. To be fair, I don't think Magnus has to hide his own stuff from Alec. No, 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 totally. I'm totally <laughs> on board with a kind of trusting Alec not to go it's poking like, yeah. through random boxes of stuff that aren't his business. I put totally. it away when he came in. It's quite clear this box is not for you. Right, totally. But there but is a kind it of... is unfortunately in eye line and therefore... Yeah, Alec does look in the box. And understandably so. He's in the wrong. It's bad. But we've all been there. Yes, I think it's interesting how deeply uncharacteristic this is of Alec. Mm -hmm. Alec has, to my memory, never snooped at anything. No. With the exception of the attempted um, (laughs) subterfuge he pulled on Lorenzo a couple of episodes ago and a similar game he played with the police officer back in season one. I don't think he has ever tried to do anything via stealth or subterfuge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This isn't him. If he wants to know something, he asks directly. Yeah. And to be fair, maybe if Magnus hadn't had to leave because of the client and was still here and the box caught his eye, yeah. he would turn around and ask. Yeah. But Magnus isn't here. And I think it's so interesting the way that Matthew is playing this. 
I like how much he's playing it as something that's deeply uncharacteristic. Like he doesn't just look over his shoulder. He looks like in eight different directions and then looks in the box and then looks around again. And it's like he looks yeah, yeah. so shifty. And he's not just keeping an eye on the front door, which of course is where Magnus left through. Yeah. He's looking up and down the hallway and up ahead as if he's checking for CCTV cameras. Yes. It's just he is yes. yeah, so, so shifty. He knows he shouldn't be doing this. He is behaving in a shifty way because this is shifty behaviour and he knows it. It's like he has no conviction in his own shiftiness. Yeah, there's nothing in his mind that's excusing his behaviour. No. So he looks in the box and I really love the way Matt interacts with the box. The kind of tentative touching of several of the items before lighting on the photograph. It's really beautiful. The fact that he isn't picking all of the things up is so gentle. It's like he doesn't want to disturb the content. Yes, absolutely. He's not moving things around. He doesn't dump everything out. He doesn't, you know, the only thing he takes out of the box is the photograph. Which is right at the top. top. So he's not disturbing anything or potentially breaking anything. And he alights on the thing in the box that he can understand, which is a photograph with a note on the back. Well, seeing as the other things in the box are that feather talisman thing, the locket with the picture of an eye, (laughs) a Victorian handkerchief, and what looks to me like a plectrum. Yeah, there's definitely a plectrum in there. There's only something shaped like a plectrum. Yeah, there's a silver stick thing that sort of looks like a magic wand, but might be a pen. Could have been a stele? No, not that thick. There's something that very much looks like either a very old-fashioned fountain pen, you mm. know, the kind with the inkwell that you had to fill manually. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Or like a Harry Potter magic wand, but cast in silver. Oh, there's it's... another jewellery esque thing in there. Yeah, there's, there's a necklace type thing. A necklace there? type thing. There's something that looks a little bit like it might be like a miniature dream catcher. That's uh, like a woven circle with kind of strings mm-hmm, and a mm-hmm. ribbon attached or charm of some kind. And it looks like at the bottom of the box are letters. Correct. I paused to look what was in the box for quite some time in case you couldn't tell. (laughs) But the thing Alec alights on is the thing at the top, so he can remove it from the box without disturbing anything else, and it's the thing he can understand. And it is a picture of Magnus in, I'd say, Victorian garb-esque. It looks Mm -hmm. kind of early 1900s-ish. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there is another man sitting in a chair. Magnus has his hand on the man's shoulder. It's quite a formal photograph. Mm. It looks quite military. The man is clearly in some kind of military uniform. I couldn't tell whether Magnus was in the no, same I, uniform. I tried to pause it several times and there's not a good frame of it. I'm sure there will be because there are people out in the fandom that are a lot better than us at this right, stuff. Right, if anybody has a higher res still frame of that and can tell us whether Magnus is also in military garb because that would be interesting, fascinating yeah. if Magnus had been involved in some kind of military activity mm. at any point. That would be really, really interesting. Because yeah, I really don't think he is but the stills that I managed to get are not good enough yeah. to you know, yeah, totally. cast my hat either way. And the note on the back is from George and says, if anything's going to keep me safe out there, it's going to be you, effectively. Uh, Love and kisses, George. (laughs) (laughs) It's exactly what it says. Exactly what it says. Now, obviously, this is poignant to us at this point in the episode for two reasons. One, that Lilith in the first scene specifically mentioned a soldier. And secondly, that Alec himself is a soldier. It doesn't take a genius. That's the kind of textural links we're drawing in this episode. It's also another man, which is obviously significant to Alec himself. Well, I think it's quite fascinating how, apart from the weird eye in the locket, gender neutral the box is. Yeah, absolutely. Which is really nice. Absolutely. I like that there aren't obviously, you know, baby pink and baby blue items Mm -hmm, in there. mm -hmm. And yeah, I do think, of course... Alec is going to alight under one thing. That's another man, handsome, of his age, soldier. Yes. Because it makes sense to him. Yes. Unlike the eye and the locket. A sense of preoccupation. I'm so disturbed by that. (laughs) (laughs) We leave that scene on Alec's face, which is interestingly inexpressive, I think. Mm -hmm. Whether he's hurt or angry or jealous or confused, it's quite difficult to tell. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think he does a nice neutral. Yeah. We cut over to Clary and Luke, who are portaled to Luke's farm. Which Luke has a farm. So he definitely has an apartment that he could have stashed Simon in the city. Or, you know, a farm. Well, yes, that too. Also, why didn't Luke go to this farm when Jocelyn died? Surely that would have been a safer place to get away from stuff and not eat campus. One would have thought. E-I-E-I-O. 
It's also, it's like, it's hardly the first time that somebody has been in need of some kind of, like, refuge or safe harbour. Like, yep. yeah. Mm. If Raphael gets banished, he's totally going to live at the farm. <laughs> yeah, he totally should. <laughs> This is apparently where Cleophus has been staying and Luke has not heard from her since he stashed her here. How did Cleophus not get locked up by the Clave? I don't know. She did really bad things. She did. I don't know whether she's on the run from the Clave. Well, yes, yeah, I thought that, but Luke kind of says, you know, this is where I brought her. He doesn't say this is where I squirreled her away and hid her from the Clave. Yeah. Because also if she was on the run from the Clave, then surely Clary wouldn't be quite so casually coming up to Luke going, I need to talk to Cleophis. She'd yeah, be going, yeah, I, suppose so. I need to talk to Cleophis. I know she's on the run. Yeah. But do you know where she yeah, is? Yeah, yeah, I suppose. So clearly the Clave went, nah, it's all right. You only murdered some people. It's fine. <laughs> Don't worry. Yeah. But apparently we're locking up Raphael and banishing him. Uh, well, yeah. It's just weird. Yeah. Also, to be honest, up to this point, I've forgotten she was alive still. <laughs> but then that's just me. Mm. But now that she's alive, I think she should be in prison. Yes. Because last time we saw her, she was escaping from that, like, auto shop garage place where Jonathan and Valentine were keeping her to mm-hmm. try and mend the sword. Where she stole the stellar and then killed, like, a dozen people. Right. And ran away. Right. And sent Luke a fire message warning him about... Yes. The thing that led to Alec and Magnus's breakup. She should definitely be locked up. <laughs> but we haven't seen her since. No, so I guess she could be presumed dead. Yeah, yeah. Because she should have been dead like several times over. So Yes. This is why I keep thinking she is. Yeah. But no, she went... <laughs> She's not dead, Ruth. <laughs> she went to live at the Happy Farm. <laughs> Interesting. With your rabbit from when you were six. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Yeah. Anyway, I'm kind of comfortable with her. Everyone else thinks she's dead yeah. and haven't kind of asked. And the Glaive have bigger problems. Right. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And also it's fine because they're currently de ruining Marys rather than chasing up, you know, old circle members and other bad people. Yeah, we haven't heard about that for a while, but um, yeah. Hard, and Cleophis hard... totally be one of those people that yeah. very recently was still active in the circle doing bad stuff. Yes, also... Unlike Maris. Also, was a circle member who, you know, elected to be a circle member. Mm. He was not a mundane who had been force-fed evil circle member making juice. Ah, yes. Radioactive <laughs> urine. <laughs> but yeah, Cleophis is absolutely the kind of person the Clave should be going after instead of Maris. And they're not... Because she's conveniently not there and marries is. The Clave's so awesome at their jobs, everybody. (laughs) Lazy and bad at stuff. Yeah. And racist. (sighs) Alec needs to sort it out. I know he's busy at the moment, but dude, get on that. Just give him a bit. Like, just give a little room to manoeuvre. Before I'm asking him to change the world. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, fine. But yes, Cleave is, is here and she's really happy to see Clary. She is. I don't know why she's really happy to see Clary. I suppose her big turning moment was the bit where Valentine was torturing an angel and Clary did save that angel. I suppose, yeah. I mean, Clary's about to kill that angel, but spoilers. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Not on purpose. No, no, but it does happen, gruesomely. We cut back over to Simon's flat. Jace is saying, so you're telling me that this guy just happened to run you over and he just happened to have a spare room in his apartment, which just happened to be full of all of your favourite things. And you're telling me that that is all completely normal and as expected to you. Yep. Simon says, no, 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 no. It's all just good luck and serendipity and happy fortune. And Jay says, yeah, I don't believe in any of that stuff. I'm a cynical, badass, sword-wielding type and luck is for... Losers. Losers. Yeah. Go Jace. Jace being hugely, hugely competent in this scene. He quite casually breaks into Kyle's bedroom to have a poke around, sees that it's interestingly spartan, and Jace finds a suspicious plant on the windowsill, which Simon adorably says is legal for personal medical use now. (laughs) (laughs) At which point Kyle enters and Jace threatens him with a serif blade. Little bit. Yes. And Kyle growls at him. So, Carl's a werewolf. Surprise. Surprise. How does Simon not know? I don't know. I mean, at least we didn't do this ruse for very long. Yes. It's not like he's lived with him for months yes, and months and totally. months. It's been 48 hours. But seeing as the werewolves spend all of their time talking about how much Simon smells, and obviously dogs are better at scenting, that's fine, but I kind of feel like Simon should be able to tell that this one smells of werewolf. Mm. I have kind of two thoughts. The first is that what does Wolfsbane do? Yeah, I've got that on my notes. I have no idea what Wolfsbane does in Shadowhunters. Because... Maybe it represses wolfiness. That would be the obvious thing, is that it prevents 
turning. But maybe it's not just that it prevents turning. Maybe it like literally. Yeah, you know, and therefore everything that goes with it. it totally. So he doesn't smell werewolfy yeah. because of the wolf spine. So that's possible. But yeah, because I, I I kind of have an issue with the wolf spine because you know generally wolf spine kills werewolves, stops them, slows them down, whatever. Yeah, but. There's this moment where Jay sees the plant and Simon goes to touch it and Jay slaps his hand away. And I was expecting the plant to be a vampire repellent plant Mm, mm -hmm. because Jay doesn't want Simon to touch it. Yes. And it would make sense for Carl to have a a backup, I suppose, for if Simon goes crackers. Yeah. Something that, you know, makes vampires unconscious or just weakens them. Though we know what that is and that's not Wolfsbane. Garlic. No, whatever it is that I can't remember what it was, but whatever Magnus gave to Raphael in that bottle. For, oh, the, the root of stuff. Root of stuff. Yeah. So that's the anti-vampire mm. plant, which definitely wasn't Wolfsbane because you'd remembered. No, 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 totally. But up to this point, we don't know the plant. I didn't look at that plant and went, ah, it's Wolfsbane. I just went, ah, it's a plant. Yes. So it could have been root of anti-vampire. <laughs> root of anti-vampire. <laughs> anyway, so that was my first point, is that we don't know what Wolfsbane does, a but wolf maybe dampener. it's some kind of wolfy dampener. My second thought was that Simon has been living amongst werewolves for a very, very long time, mm. and maybe he's become kind of immured of the smell. Well, this is, you know, if you live with dogs, you don't really smell wet dog anymore, right, do you? exactly. Also, he's shagging one of them. Yes. And he's probably going to smell of her a lot. Yes, exactly. No, I think that's fair. I mean, it would be nice if any of this was textualised. <laughs> Rather than just me having to make it up. It's what we should have called the podcast. Making slug up with (laughs) Ruth and Michelle. (laughs) Nice. Jace asks who Kyle is and where he's from and what pack he belongs to and what on earth he thinks he's doing. And Kyle says reluctantly that he's proto-lupus. It's an order of wolves who have taken on a duty or a mission to help... Sake a dive to do stuff. To help other wolves slash lonely vampires i suppose (laughs) um jay says he's never met one but he does at that point lower his blade Mm. i adore how instantly he stands down yes it is so military yes it's beautiful i have a whole bunch of stuff to say kind of at the end about jace as a soldier in this episode and i kind of want to save it okay there's there's a whole bunch of interesting stuff going on there simon is offended that he's been lied to that Kyle has sort of taken upon himself to control his life and what right did he have to do that? And that Kyle designed this place for him. Which is creepy. So creepy. So, so creepy. I mean, beautiful wording. Yes. Like he says it and my skin crawls. Yes. It's interesting in light of that conversation we had when Kyle first appeared about Kyle looking like he was supposed to be friends with someone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Being the right age right. and, you know, the kind of the right level of stoner kid. Right, right age right dress sense right yep. attitude he was designed for simon and it will be interesting kind of from this point on as mm-hmm, we see mm-hmm. kyle how much he changes yep. and how much it was a persona that he was putting on for simon's benefit yeah because chai does a wonderful job of changing his voice and the way he delivers his lines yeah the shift he does in this scene is beautiful and brilliant yeah. especially as he does it at blade point he goes from kind of angry and frightened and blade to i'm completely in control of this situation mm. and jace's blade has not moved yeah, yeah, yeah. Kind of, he's still got a sword to his throat he's still like in danger of his life no but- totally Simon demands to know why he wasn't told the truth and Kyle says, I would have told you in the right time if I'd really said that I was a werewolf after all you went through with the Jade Wolf pack, Mm -hmm, would you mm -hmm. have trusted me, spoken to me? And Simon goes, yeah, I probably would have. And the beautiful thing is that you know Simon is speaking the absolute truth. Absolutely. It's like one of the beautiful things about Simon is that he is almost completely unprejudiced. Yes, he takes people at their word and yeah yeah. the thing that i find interesting in terms of this being a perfectly laid trap for simon is that actually if kyle had come in and said i'm a werewolf that would have made all of this easier yeah Yeah, yeah, yeah. simon would have been like more up for living with him surely if he was like you're a young lonely werewolf therefore you know about vampires therefore i don't have to keep my mini fridge sequestered in my room and all of that business about privacy that's not necessary and obviously Carl doesn't know that. No, sure. So, you know, sure. it makes perfect sense for him to go with the thousands of years of animosity that we still don't know anything about. Right. But yeah, if he'd gone, I'm a werewolf, 
And I can tell that to you because I can smell you're a vampire. Yes. And I don't have a pack or I tried to separate from my pack. Or I, know, was, just... I was with a pack back in Melbourne, but yeah. then now I moved I'm here. and I've not got any real interest in meeting up with another pack. I just want to live my life, man. And you know, know, it's like I'm, I'm at college and I'm a bicycle messenger and that's just what I want to do. Yeah. Kind of what interests me is that Kyle's research clearly only extends so far. Yeah. That he has done enough research to know the kind of things he should say, the kind of way he should behave, the kind of trap he should set. But he has not done sufficient research to work out that Simon would have been more likely to say yes to moving in. If he'd just been honest. To a degree, anyway. If he'd admitted to being a downwelder. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's interesting, the kind of limitations of his Mm. knowledge. That's interesting. It also comes out that... Kyle was the one who cancelled Simon's gig. Yep. Simon breaks his lease and leaves. Yes. Leaving Jace behind with Kyle. Yes. <laughs> I mean, one kind of is fairly sure that Jace leaves pretty soon oh, after. Yeah. But, you know, Jace is really interesting in this scene. There's a really interesting kind of, like, change in his body language. I mean, obviously, he goes from, like, actively threatening Kyle to being at significant ease. But he's almost taken a kind of mediator role in this interaction. Yeah. Like, you kind of get the impression that if Simon went for him, he'd step in and break up the fight. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a certain part of me that kind of looks at this conflict between two young downworlders with a shadow hunter present to mediate and thinks, well, maybe that's what the shadow hunters exactly <laughs> should be doing. Maybe this is a kind of textbook example of the way in which shadow hunters should interact with the downworld. Yeah, the way the as, play should actually operate. Right. As calm, impartial mediators. Yeah. Which is not words that you would have put on Jace. No. I think the other thing is also that, of course, he goes from active to really quite passive because turns out he did solve all of Simon's mysteries in two hours and now he's done. Mm. Yeah, there's a really interesting thing going on with Jace and passivity. But yeah. as I say, we've got a long conversation to have about Jace at the end, so we'll kind of circle back to all of that. We cut over to Alec in his office. Being pretty at the window. Being pretty at the window. Underhill enters. He says that the mainframe has been rebooted and it's back online. They did try to turn it off and turn it back on. They did, yeah. Solid. Good time. Alex says, cheers, and (laughs) you can go now. Good times. And Underhill lingers, and Alex says, sort of, what, now? (laughs) What's up, dude? Yes, still. Mm. And Underhill basically thanks him for enabling him to come out in the Mm -hmm. Institute that he didn't think he was ever going to be able to, and that it's thanks to Alec and his open, loving, caring, wonderful (laughs) OTP relationship with High Warlock of Brooklyn, Max Bain. Um, (laughs) The scene's lovely, and I really like that we are having this scene yes that we are textualizing the path that alec is plowing for other shadow hunters yes and i love how confused alec is yep. he had never even occurred to him that he might be setting a precedent for other people mm-hmm. and that people might be looking up to him over this yeah the performances in this are both lovely i adore that underhill calls him sir like yep two three times multiple times totally but his commitment to professionalism and his respect for alex rank is yeah. so completely evident in every line he speaks and no absolutely in his body language and his deference it's just beautiful yeah no stephen byers is really really nice in it though i must say the bit where we get to committed loving trusting yeah, I could do without that too. Aren't you? Aren't you? Hmm? 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 Yeah. Don't you feel bad for what you did with that box? I could do without it for kind of two separate reasons. Firstly, that it's really on the nose and we don't need this. We know Alec did a bad thing. We know Alec did a bad thing. Alec knows he did yeah. a bad thing. Alec knows that he's got it really good. We don't need anybody to convince us that Magnus and Alec are a good thing and that they should keep seeing each other. <laughs> Nobody needs to be convinced of that. I also don't think that Alec needed anyone to convince him to, you know, go to Magnus and confess. No. He would have got he was always himself. going to. Yeah. He was always going to. It's just too much. So, yes, on that level, it's too much. I also, from a in-text level, because that's all kind of metatextual... How does Underhill know? How does Underhill know? Yeah. And why is it relevant? 
I'm totally on board with Underhill coming in and sort of saying, not only are you out, but you're in a committed relationship with a warlock of all yeah, people. Yeah, totally. Oh, Stop there. That's great. Yeah. Like, totally on board with all that. But, like, he doesn't know anything about their relationship. He doesn't know there's loving, caring or trusting. It's none of his business. And for me, the cardinal sin of the line is that it steps on the toes of his beautiful deference. Oh, totally. It becomes really inappropriate at that yes. point. It becomes really, really yes. buddy, buddy. But also, have you been, like, outside their house with binoculars? Yeah. Like, it's kind of creepy. Yeah. And, yeah, I completely agree. It's completely changing his tone from being so respectful to his commanding officer to making inappropriate remarks about his relationship. Yes. It doesn't matter that they're nice remarks. They're no. inappropriate. Yeah, totally. Yeah. But that's not Steve's fault. No. Steve and Matt both beautiful in the scene. Yeah. I adore the shift in Matt's face when he realises the little kind of, oh, yeah, it's beautiful. And again, you know, why say it 300 times when you could say it 800 times? Matthew Daddario can do really impressive things with his face. Y'all. It's good face. <laughs> to die wouldn't be to die if we didn't say that at least <laughs> once every six episodes, I think. I think there's something kind of additionally interesting going on here that sort of harkens back to what you were saying about letting Alex age show. Mm -hmm. I mean, Underhill says he's been on the front lines for 10 years. Yeah. And even factoring in that 10 years on the front lines as a shadow hunter might mean, like, as an independent shadow hunter, so from when you were, like, 15. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But... 13 to 23, yeah. But the implication, and, you know, the actor is cast older. I have no idea how old the actor is in real life. But Underhill is cast older than Alec is. Yeah, I don't know how old Steve is, but he certainly looks older than Alec. Yes. So there's a kind of oddness there anyway. You know, you're very aware that Alec is a precociously young leader mm -hmm, mm -hmm. during this scene. And then Alec realises that he's being thanked for coming out, basically. And his face does that shift thing. And he goes from being this kind of head of the Institute, Alec, with that sort of stony face and very set shoulders to doing the sort of wide eyes, eyebrows raised, yeah. little yeah, boy yeah, yeah, thing yeah. that he does. And it's a beautiful shift in terms of his scepticism to his surprise. But also that's Institute Alec going to Alec Alec in the space of a microsecond. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And that's really lovely too. Mm. We cut over to the farmhouse. Clary and Luke and Cleophus are chatting about the prospect of summoning Ethereal. Cleophus says that she's been trying to summon the angels and can't, but thinks that Clary might be able to because of angel blood and mm -hmm. because she's special and all of that. Which is totally fine. Yep. Luke's worried about the risks, but Clary's very determined to follow through on it anyway. I do think we have to call out the fact that we are changing or shifting a little bit the availability of angels in the world. Yeah. Like, to go from... No one in the sisterhood has ever seen one to... We can casually summon them. Right. So go from Isabel and Alec zooming in on one on mm. the Institute screen to be able to see like the tiniest speck of shooting star angel and Cleophus crying at the idea of an angel being bound on Earth. The idea that not only can the sisterhood summon angels, which I don't have so much of a problem mm. with, the idea that this is like, yes, notionally possible, to, oh yes, I've been trying to summon an angel for weeks <laughs> and haven't been able to. I mean, firstly, why was she trying to summon an angel? I mean, I think literally just because she's clearly aware how much she's messed up in life. Mm. So I'm assuming it was a testing at first and then it didn't work. Right. But and like, then she kept trying. I think the one reason why they get away with it is that clear face never actually says I've been trying to summon an angel for weeks. She says I've been trying to communicate with the angels. Okay, yeah, yeah. And she says back in Iron Sisters that the sisters hear the angel whisper when they forge the weapons. Yes. So they're aware they exist. Yes. They communicate with them. They haven't seen one. Yeah, all right. I think it's a bit of a leap from that to you can totally summon one. But she says that even when they're doing the summoning circle, she says, the angels have heard you, but for you to hear them, you now have to stand here by yourself for a couple of hours doing mm -hmm, hokey pokey. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the fact that Ethereal actually shows up, I think it's kind of unexpected. Yes, okay. I think it was just about Fair being enough. able to commune with him. Fair enough. But I do feel like there's a shift in... Yeah, no, I mean, I think it's all still way too easy Yeah, from just how much all we had before. Yeah. 
I also think they could have fixed it really easily by doing something which I never thought I'd say that they should have done, but which is making Clary more special. Making the fact that she's got angel blood yeah, yeah, yeah. more of a thing. If Cleophas has said, we hear the angels whisper, but we have no way of reaching out to them. Mm-hmm. They're involved in the making of our weapons, but we don't. This isn't like a communication thing. It's not like a phone call, but you have angel blood. This is a real Dude. solid yeah. thing that we can use that to. I'd be so much more on board with that than this kind of slightly wishy washy. Oh, yes, you can because you have angel blood, but I can't because I've been thrown out of the sisterhood. Which yeah, is sort rather of... than because I don't have angel blood. Right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 That's the direction I would have gone in. And yeah, heaven forfend that I encourage anybody to, you know, more unearned privilege and <laughs> all of that. But At least it's the same privilege as always. Yes. But yeah. if you're going to give somebody unearned privilege or secret powers, mm. at least make them use them. Yeah. Yeah. I do really like the lines in this, though, the bit where. Luke points out that there's a risk and asks what it is. And Cleo says that the angel could lash out. And yeah. Clary says, but he never has before. And Luke saying, I know this is important, but so are you. Yeah. And her saying, yeah, and so is Jace. Yeah. I just think it's a beautiful yeah, it's bit nice. of exchange of lines. It's nice. We cut over to Isabel and Charlie on their date. They're getting to know each other. He's frightened of blood. And why did he become a doctor? And it's the family business. And she makes jewellery. And that's the family <laughs> business too. And okay, that's slightly bizarre, but fine. She works with her brothers. And it's really, really busy and not at all quiet. And Which is true. Which is true. Not a word of a lie. It's slightly surreal thinking of all of that business happening because they're all jewellery designers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, yes, the frantic world of jewellery making. No, no, she makes jewellery. Jay's mines the metal from their house, and <laughs> yeah, and Alec is in distribution of PR. <laughs> uh, yeah, okay, fine. I mean, yeah. the house would be noisy and messy if Jace was mining <laughs> for metal in it from the basement. If they had a silver mine in their basement, then yeah, it would be a little noisy. Or oh, any old metal mine. I mean, you know. I don't think it matters. I don't think it no. matters what metal you're mining. If you're doing it in your basement, that's going to cause disruption. <laughs> Oh, yes. Have you never been in a New York townhouse? They've all got metal mines in the basement. Yep. (laughs) Now, while I'm totally down with the new bracelet and are seeing Isabel trying to fix Magnus's Mm -hmm. demon warning necklace earlier, I didn't think that the setting had been the problem. I think the problem was a bit way it shattered. Well, it sort of cracked. Yeah, but the jewel cracked. I was looking at it and I was wondering whether it was smaller. Okay. I was wondering whether she'd maybe, maybe she'd recut she'd it. Recut it. Mm. Yeah, maybe. The date works mostly well for me. I think. I think there's a bit of a ominous tone, like Charlie might turn out to be evil throughout this episode, and I'm not sure whether that's intentional or not. <laughs> or whether you have trust issues. Oh, possibly. Mm. No, I can kind of see the potential creepy vibe, but I think that's just because he's too good to be true. Maybe. And it didn't work for Kyle and Simon. Yes. They weren't happily ever after. Yes. But yeah, they're largely it works. Yeah, I think mostly it's cute. Isabel's interesting in how different she is she just didn't in any way prepare for mundane conversation right she's completely stumped when he goes tell me about you what do you do uh (laughs) like she's done yeah and that's kind of adorable yeah and charlie's really sweet you know he's kind of too sweet and i can see how you might be worried about it (laughs) but he's really sweet and you know he does seem to genuinely like her yeah he does her and her snaky bracelet her and her snaky bracelet we the they finish their dinner. We get a quick shot of Lilith's demon who's following scents of stuff in some back alley. Who, yeah, has found Isabel in Clary's dress rather than Clary. Yeah. So demons also are dope. Yes. But I'm also kind of worried about Clary's ability to do laundry. I mean, I suppose your clothing still smells of you even after you've washed it. it yeah, but surely it smells less of you than, you know, you. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I suppose she is, like, out in the country. We don't know where Luke's farmhouse is, how far away it is. Uh, yes, I suppose from the Church of Talto, the demon was closer to scent traces on the dress than mm. he was to Clary in the countryside. Yes. Yeah, fair enough. But you'd also think that Clary's wardrobe in the Institute, full of her clothing? Yes, though I would have thought that at least, like, all of Magnus's wards and all of that so. would, you know, dampen that. Yes, but you'd think that maybe you'd get, an, like, a demon that was, like, lurking outside. That would have been kind of cute if we'd seen the mm. demon, like, lurking outside the if Institute. Charlie had dropped Izzy home. 
Or just instead of that cutaway to Demon outside in Alley, we could have got Demon outside Institute with all of the smells and going, oh, well, clearly I can't get in there. Yeah. And then moving on and have finding, go, yeah. you know, another Clary smell in yeah. the city. Oh, so now I feel bad for the Demon. <laughs> A little cutie pie demon. He's not a little so cutie com- pie demon. So confused by smell. He's scary and covered in tar. And in a bit, he's too. Yes. Yes, yes, he is. <laughs> we cut back to Izzy and Charlie, who are going for a drink, but then the demon bracelet pulses. It's amazing how she's made the special effect better in resetting and recutting the gem. She's really good at being the weapons master. Yeah. yeah. Mm. She went, I love you, Magnus, but the LED thing just so 90s <laughs> Isabel excuses herself Charlie is clearly hurt and wounded but says fair enough what's he going to do <laughs> if if you want Tackle to leave her. then then fair <laughs> enough Isabel ducks down the alley she finds the demon and this is a really awesome fight scene yeah she whoops his ass and then she whoops both his asses casually and controlledly and she is exhibiting all of her formidable shadow hunter power yep. in a completely appropriate context just i'm in love with this yeah. this is i think maybe the first time we've actually seen isabel's fighting prowess go all out yes yeah because we had the fight on a rooftop which was over in three seconds and nonsense yep and otherwise we just had her randomly whipping stuff yep no, this is so good. It's awesome. I mean, I think it may be a little sacrilegious to say, but I like her fighting with the staff way better than I like her fighting with the whip. Well, because she can actually fight with the staff. Yeah. Anyway, it's really awesome. Love all of this stuff. She takes down the demon after, as you say, cutting it in half and accidentally making two demons Whoops. and then having to do it twice. Lilith senses the demon's death, which is interesting. Yeah, I'm not sure why she senses the demon's death. I mean, possibly the demon's from Edom and she kind of has a connection to all Edom maybe, things. Maybe. Because he's also covered in tar. He is also It might be like a little cousin. Oh, and I feel bad about the demon again. Don't feel bad about the demon. <laughs> <laughs> she says that she's going to have to clearly do this whole soul slivering thing herself. She turns into a dragon and jumps out the window. Yeah. <laughs> she's no nonsense. I appreciate that. In a I evil, kind of love it. Evil... Especially demon cause, goddess. Especially because you've got a weird <laughs> disciple next to going, what do you mean? He jumped out the window. <laughs> ha. <laughs> but yeah, it turns out she is the mother of all dragons. Yes. Mm. She's bigger and browner. Yes. Yeah. We cut back over to Isabel, who's in the alley, and Charlie has come to find her. She so, so smoothly and quickly breaks the heel off her shoe. I love and it. And pretends to fall. She's just on it. It's great. For all the issues we may have had with Isabel's behaviour last episode, I am so on board with Isabel yeah. this episode. I mean, is you know, like all those episodes we've had where we decide that everyone's taking their moron pills that morning? Yeah. yeah. Everyone's taking their smart pills yeah, that morning. Yeah, no, it's great. It's great. Charlie says that she needs stitches for the cut in her head until she comes to the hospital with him. Yep. He finds her stellate on the floor and gives it back to her because he can tell it's her style, which is kind of cute. Yeah, no, I, I really like that, actually, because he ostentatiously drops in that way that normally it would be left behind in the alley. For somebody or, else to find, yeah. Yeah, or found by Charlie to then lead to a big drama. Mm-hmm. But I literally just like, oh, here's a weird thing and he's got more snakes on, must be you. <laughs> we cut over to Clary and Luke and Cleophus in the woods. Cleophus draws Clary a angel summoning circle and... Yep. And adds just a sousson of Adamus to it. Yeah, just just a smidge. Yep. She says the rest is down to Clary and that Cleophus and Luke have to leave to avoid angering the angel. Yeah. So I understand completely why Cleophus might anger the angel. What's Luke ever done? I don't think we had any suggestion at any point that the angels actually felt particularly strongly about downworld no. one way or the other and we certainly know that you know giles told us killing downworlders is not the mm. wish of the angel i mean i suppose that there could be a kind of downworlders are all fine and humans are all fine and whatever but you can't look right, upon me the only angel blooded creatures yeah, yeah, yeah. can be in the presence of angels which kind of makes sense i suppose totally and that would be a perfectly fine thing for her to say but she's not yeah just say we can't look at him yeah it's fine I do like Cleophis leaving, saying, may the angel be with you. Yes, nice. I, I yeah, love it. Very nice. So Clary's standing in her glowy circle, 
waiting for the angel. Yep. We cut to Simon on the street. He's busking. Jay's walks past and tosses a fairly substantial amount of money in his guitar case. He's got all the cash this episode. Apparently so. Simon says, leave me alone. I'm taking your money, but yep. leave me alone. Jay's asks whether he's seriously planning on living in his van. Simon basically says, I don't know what I'm going to do, but I'm not down with being manipulated and lied to and the scary, wolfy Knights Templar thing is <laughs> yeah. no good at all. A little bit creepy. Yeah. And Jay says... I understand it's not ideal. I understand that you're feeling violated and angry about all of this, but you're not in the best position to sniff at help when it's offered to you. Yep. I mean, this is absolutely 100% Jace doing that thing that Jace does, which is giving somebody else a pep talk when the pep talk's really for him. Oh, totally. Usually with Jace, it comes the other way around. Mm -hmm. Usually, Jace gives somebody else the pep talk and then has the realisation. Or sees someone else do the right thing and then... And then does the right thing. Follows and does the right thing. In this instance, he's had the realisation, he's giving the pep talk, and then he's doing the right thing. So the pep talk bit is coming in the middle, and what he's actually doing, that Jacey borrowing of other people's moral strength thing that he's done several times in the past... Is actually ensuring that Simon goes and does it. Right. Yeah. And I think having the graciousness to accept help verbally, actually, practically, not Mm -hmm. just I'm going to accept help in the Alex suggested that I go and talk to the Silent Brothers about this thing and offered to help me and I'm going to do it. But also I need to tell him that I'm accepting the help and I'm doing it. I need to actually verbally acknowledge it. Yes. And I think that's the thing that Jace is borrowing from Simon's situation for Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. as ever that consistency of characterization is just beautiful and this is one of my favorite jace things it's so characterful and it's sort of sweet it is really quite innocent yes and it's just been so consistent which obviously is something that we love in this podcast consistency and competency but Jace's kind of willingness to learn from other people's emotional journeys mm-hmm, mm-hmm. is just really lovely. And because he knows textually that he's kind of emotionally incompetent. Yeah, totally. It's almost a conscious learning. Yeah, it's, it's almost observing like observing what other humans right, do. Right, it's like, well, you did it this way and that was right. I can tell from the context this was the correct mm. course of action and I'm going to do that too. And I do think some of it is just about seeing his little quest through. Yes, Is absolutely. that obviously he's uncovered the mystery but he's not solved it yes yeah and he wants to make sure that simon's okay yeah and again i think this scene feeds into that conversation we're going to have at the end about <laughs> jason authority in the system and completing missions right we cut over to alec at the loft we do he comes into the apothecary and apologises for snooping. Mm-hmm. Magnus knows he's been snooping because he's a very clever warlock and knows all about all shifty <laughs> things that are happening in his vicinity, even demon goddesses who come by in the morning for help completely innocently. Oh, wait, no. Maybe. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Whatever, Magnus. <laughs> You have lost all authority on your all-knowing <laughs> knowingness. You know nothing. But he did know that Alec had gone snooping in the box, so I suppose he does know that. Alec says, I had no right, it was an invasion of your privacy. Magnus says, I accept the apology. Mm-hmm. There's a little beat where Alec sort of goes, good, right, okay, that's that off the checklist. Yeah. I've made that right. Yeah. So, And this really innocent smile yep. that he gives, which yep. I think is beautiful. Yeah, it's really lovely. But it is like I realised my wrongs and I've come up with the three reasoning how I was wrong mm-hmm. and straightforward and openly told you. Yeah. And it's the second time or possibly even the third time where Magnus says, I accept your apology, which is really interesting phrasing. I really struggle saying, I accept your apology. Yeah. Not because I don't, but because I think it's a really formal way of saying yeah, it. Yeah. And it kind of makes it sound weird. Yeah. So I kind of go, now you're okay. Which actually is saying what you did wasn't wrong. Mm-hmm. And no, it was. Yes. It totally was. But I do think there's also something that's just very tick box for both of them yeah is Alec going here's what I did wrong and Magnus going okay yes those are the things you did wrong fair enough yes Alec is kind of pleased that their communication worked out yes it's a little like successful interaction yeah totally <laughs> Magnus is angry yeah he's very very clipped well I think the Alec opening arrived. of this scene is interesting because yeah. Alec is quite confrontational when he says I tried calling you yes 
And Magnus is, yeah, curt, saying, I was busy. Yeah. And he kind of puts Alec in his place. Yeah. Because, yeah, Alec tried to call him because Alec wanted to apologise and Magnus wasn't letting him. Mm -hmm. And so he had to come home from the Institute to come and do this. Yeah. And so he's a little bit miffed, but he's really in the wrong. Yes. So I think they start off at really interesting places. Yeah. And, yeah, then successful interaction, number one. Yes. And that's about as high as we're going to count in this scene. Right. So then Alec resets and asks the direct question mm-hmm. in a kind of, this is what I should have done in the first place. Yeah. I am now yeah. going to do this properly. And I'm just going to ask you about it. And so he asks about George. Magnus says he was very special. He was a brave soldier, not unlike someone else that I might mention, mm-hmm. which seems like an unhelpful link to be drawing at this particular point in the conversation. Yeah, I think, again, I think it's really interesting because... Absolutely. Don't compare Alec to one of your exes right now. Yeah, not good. But I do think it just goes to show that Magnus isn't in this conversation. Yeah. He is in a completely different place because normally Magnus would realise this stuff and he wouldn't make such obvious blunders. Yes. Well, it's interesting that in the way that Alec's kind of certainty when he asked Magnus to move in... Mm -hmm made me cringe because of the lack of self-preservation. Yeah, yeah. Usually Magnus's words are riddled with self-preservation. Mm-hmm, he mm-hmm. is king of plausible deniability and of the couching things so that they mostly mean one thing. Yeah, yeah. But if that isn't what's best for the situation, they could mean another. Mm-hmm. He's a master of it. It's what he does all the time. So it's interesting hearing him kind of fumble. Yeah. But not even realise he's fumbling. Yeah. He's so distant from Alex's emotional place at the moment. I think certainly one of the explanations is going right back to Alex having caught him in this nostalgia in the first scene. Mm -hmm. And the fact that he's still kind of there. Yeah. Because I think he thinks it's a compliment. I think he's thinking about George and he's remembering being in love with this man who was wonderful and brave. Yeah. And their qualities that he sees in Alec. Yep. And I think it's a compliment in his mind. Yes. Not realising that it's really not the best thing to say right now. Yes. Because he takes him until he leaves to go and make cocktails to even stop and ask about jealousy. Yes. And I don't think it's because he's not occurred to him what is going on in Alec's head. It kind of feels like he hasn't paused to stop and think about it. Yeah. To actually wonder why Alex snooped. Yes. It's like after the conversation they had in the morning, it didn't even occur to him that he might be coming home to a slightly more like loaded evening Mm -hmm. than what was normally expected. Yeah, totally. It's like he was shocked and upset to find that Alec had been snooping rather than kind of anticipating that there might be some upset this evening. Yeah, yeah. And more conversation to be had. I just do think that Magnus is just stuck in this bubble of remembering lost loves. And maybe there's part of that that's about holding himself away from Alec in the moment because of that. Oh, 100%. You know, yeah. It's like, I want to get into it more in a couple of lines, Mm, but yeah, yeah, totally. So Magnus goes off to make Monday martinis. Yep. Monday Monday. Malik crazed author, note for you. <laughs> are you able to correlate your timeline for this being a Monday? Nice. <laughs> this is our challenge to you. Inquiring minds want to know, <laughs> is it really Monday? <laughs> this will be the one episode she's not actually listening to. <laughs> that aside, moving on, it is apparently Monday. Martini Monday. Apparently Alex, a gin martini kind of a man. Good to know. Instantly. Yeah, straight up. I like tonally his kind of completely toneless answer to the question. Mm-hmm. Like, yes, I want a martini. Yes, it's going to be gin. And we are not done with this conversation. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not letting it distract, but also alcohol. Yeah. <laughs> Magnus is almost all the way out the door before he kind of clocks to the fact that Alec isn't okay. Like, in no way is he okay. He says, you're not jealous, are you? In a slightly... That would be ridiculous. Yes, yeah, it's quite light. Yeah. Alex says, you were weird when I asked you earlier about moving Mm -hmm, in. mm -hmm. Which is interesting. It's not a confirmation that he's jealous. Well, I kind of feel like Alec isn't sure whether he's jealous or not. I think he's not sure whether he's got anything to be jealous of. Yeah, totally. Alec's not stupid. Yeah. He can tell the picture's black and white. 
but he doesn't know whether George is a warlock, for example. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. He might still be around. Or a vampire. We know yeah, that Max totally. had relationships with them in the past. So I think it is literally just Alec being careful because he's not sure whether he is jealous or not at this point. Yeah. He just knows that Magnus was weird. Yes. And it goes right back to him not understanding why Magnus doesn't want to move in with him and Magnus not actually having explained it properly this morning. Yes. You know, you were weird and this could be one of the reasons. Yes. Alec asks if he's still alive. Well, he doesn't ask if he's still alive. He says, is he still? Yeah, and I don't actually think the end of the sentence is alive. I mean, that's what Magnus answers. Yeah. Sort of. Well, he says he's been dead for a century. Yeah, because I think, you know, that could literally be, is he still in the picture? Yes. Is and, he still special to you? Yeah, and he's been dead for over a century. I think, again, he's a very pointed non answer to the question. Yeah, totally. I really like that Alec trails off at that point, that he's not defining it. And, yeah, very, very Magnus answer, isn't it? Yes, totally. So, at this point, Alec says, well, why have you still got a box of his stuff? Mm -hmm. Yeah, at this point, Alec loses me a little bit. Yeah, because he doesn't ask that question like it's a challenge. He asks that question like it's a genuine question. Yeah, totally. Like, why on earth would you keep a whole bunch of stuff for a dead dude? Yeah. Like, this bit is weird. And, I mean, his follow-up to this as well, when Magnus says, it's not all George's, and he goes... Well, whose is it then? Again, I do think it's the writer showing Alex's age Mm -hmm. dramatically, Mm -hmm. but he does lose me. Yes. Just because I need him to get there faster. Well, there's that. But there's also, I have kind of a particular issue with this, given that not two episodes ago, Alec was making stew from a recipe his grandmother had. (laughs) Yeah that he'd kept yeah yeah this was a thing that alec was doing because it was a memory it was memento Mm. it was heritage it was sentimental sentimental he understands about sentiment this isn't new and i don't know whether he's literally just so confused by magnus at the moment he's just trying to break it down as much as he can maybe just take it literally one step at a time tiny tiny steps and trying to not make any assumptions because he started off the day making assumptions and that went terribly wrong I also don't know whether there's anything in here about Alec and possessions, mm-hmm. which may be mm-hmm. a little bit of a over analysis or a reach. But I was trying to think back on it because I was I, I thought about the stew recipe and that that is definitely a nostalgic thing. That is a way in which you remember somebody who is no longer with you. But that's not about the possession. Like, we inferred that the recipe card was his grandmother's Mm. recipe card, but the important thing to Alec was not the recipe card, it was the recipe. It was the food that you provide for your family and the food that they provided for his mother. That made her happy. That made her happy. That was the important thing. And so I was thinking back on it and trying to work out whether we had any other kind of indication that Alec has any emotional attachment to any Mm -hmm. objects at all. And the only example we have of him having any attachment to any object is his bow and quiver. Which, of course, is backed up by Magnus going through that exact same thought process when he's asking for a prize for his trial. Now, interestingly, we've had from Jace an attachment to his leather jacket. Mm -hmm. Jace's favourite leather jacket that Alec put in the washing machine at some point in youthful foibles past. We've also had Jace's attachment to a falcon, which is obviously slightly different in that it's a living thing and a bird, Mm. but does sort of suggest some kind of association between non-human beings and fondness and affection and attachment. Isabel is surrounded by personal effects. She has dozens of things that are hers. She has her bracelet, but she also has the necklace that Magnus gave her that she resets. She has jewellery. She has clothing that's significant to her. And, of course, she's got that entire box that she packs Melion into. She's got an entire box she packs Melion into. She has an entire box she packs herself into when she has to turn into her mother. She has a huge amount of attachment and association she places on physical objects. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't think we have ever, with the exception of his bow and quiver, seen Alec place any significance on any physical object. No, no. I don't think Alec has possessions that matter. I think he doesn't understand a box of mementos. Mm, Yeah, kind of backed up by the soon-to-be-breaking-our-hearts line about his arrowhead landing in that box. Yeah. Because it's the only thing he can think of. Yeah. 
which is obviously interesting as far as we're concerned because we know what Magnus would put in the box. Yep. And it's not an arrowhead. No, we've all been having bleeding hearts over the Amamori right. charm this week. Right. But as far as Alex concerned, yeah. the significance of the Omamori charm was not the Omamori charm. The significance was that it was a thoughtful thing that he'd done for Magnus in a way that people had not done thoughtful things mm. for Magnus many times before. He, when he gives it to Magnus, specifically mentions that it's supposed to bring him luck and protection. Yeah. What he wants from this gift is to bring Magnus luck and protection. Yeah. Those are not objects. Those are intangible things. And of course, he's got no awareness that Magnus had that on him. Yeah. All the time. Yeah. To be honest, I think if you asked Alec right now, they'd probably think they were somewhere in this crazy flat full of stuff. Yeah, probably. Probably. I think you've got a point. They doesn't think about objects that way. I think it's interesting that Alec is having this whole episode, this scene, in Magnus's shirt. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. There is a physical object that he's placing significance on, that he's placing value on, whether he's intellectualised that or not. Yeah, 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 yeah. But surely there's a significance in wearing Magnus's shirt in this episode, in this conversation, which is so much about the significance one places on objects to remember people by. Especially because there were several moments where Magnus left and Alec was left behind unhappy Mm -hmm. and he was still in the flat. He could have changed. Yep. And at the end of this fight, where clearly he leaves the loft to go back to the Institute despite the fact that it's now night and he's been at work since sometime around lunchtime. Again, he could have changed. Yep, and he doesn't. And he doesn't. Yep. Yeah. So I think the shirt has some significance, but I think it's more of a symbolic significance than an an itemised significance. Because, of course, the other thing that we've seen Alec form an emotional attachment to that's not a person is Magnus's shampoo. (laughs) Again, that's a sensual, experiential yeah. kind of a thing. That's the same as the food. And yeah, you smell know. memory is right. crazy. We all know that. Right. I'm kind of, the more I think about it and the more I articulate it, the more convinced I become of this being a factor mm. in this. In his confusion. Because I too was sort of hung up on this, like, you utter moron. Why is he so yeah. confused about this box of mementos? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, how does he think? Magnus remembers all of the people mm. who he's lost, yeah. who he knows he's lost. You yeah. Know? yeah, yeah, yeah. Certainly who he should know, even if he's not thought about right. it. yeah. Which I think also puts a new light on his anger over him becoming nothing but an arrowhead in that box. Right. Because objects mean nothing. Yeah. yeah objects yeah, yeah, yeah. are worthless and meaningless. Yeah. Onions. Baskers of onions. <laughs> <laughs> at least might explain why I'm very sad and crying. <laughs> Magnus says that he keeps the things because he may be magical, but his memory certainly isn't, which I love. Mm -hmm, I love this mm -hmm. idea, this kind of textualization that being immortal is a seriously weird psychological thing to go through. And yeah, your brain isn't magic off the back of it, for lack of a better word. Yeah, I really like that. Magnus also says that every item in the box belongs to someone he has loved and outlived. Yes, Which is interestingly specific. I think it's really interesting that there's an implication that all the items in the box belong to mortals. Yes. And I don't know how much that feeds into his walls and his commitment issues and, of course, all of his heartbreak with Camille. Mm -hmm. The only other immortal he's ever thought about having a relationship that was true and real. Yes. Completely laughed in his face because immortals aren't meant for that. Yes. But also whether he's only allowed himself to be vulnerable enough to end up in relationships that mean this much to him with people that were ultimately going to die. Mm, mm, where there was ultimately a variation a, date on A, a get-out clause, yeah. yeah. Yeah, which is which kind just of makes horrific yeah. to think about. But I do think there is a clear implication yes. that it's mortals. Yeah, no, totally. Not only that it's mortals, but it's mortals that he has loved until they have died. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, rather than mortals that he has spent some happy years with and then, then, then they left have him parted that ways he left, yeah. for whatever reason. Because also, you know, he and Dodd had a thing and we have analysed the fact that that was not a thing for him and it was a bit of a thing for her. Yeah. But as far as we know, though, again... Show's a bit dodgy on it. <laughs> She's dead now. Mm-hmm. You know, immortals die also. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yes, he has lost two immortal friends yeah. within the base of this show. Slightly like less than two, two months. months. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Then Magnus says, 
Alec, you know my history. I've always been honest about that. Yeah. And then I have to come back round to the whole 1700, 17,000 thing. Because yeah. Magnus has not been honest with him about that. Because of that thing that we talked about at great and exhausting length <laughs> back then, which is that at some point in that conversation, Magnus changes the conversation from being about romantic partners to being about sexual partners. Yeah, at some point Magnus changes the rules. Magnus changes that in that conversation. And the thing that's vaguely interesting, and I don't know how much the prop department put effort into this, but it's entirely plausible there's 17 things in that box. Possible. There's yeah. the right number of cluttery items. Yep. But yeah, he's not been honest with Alec. And of course, then things escalated and then Magnus thought Alec was going to leave him and yep. then Alec didn't. Yep. And you're not going to bring it up again that night because, nope. hey, close call, let's not push our luck. And obviously at that point in time, it was really early days to be calling whatever they had a committed relationship. Yes. You know, it's kind of like... And Alec had actually These said, were the 17 loves of my life. Might have been a little heavy for, little bit. for the moment they were in. Totally. And Alec said, I don't care who you've been with. Yes. But that's not the end of that. But that's not the end of that. He has not been honest with Alec about this. And I don't know whether this is more of Magnus being cagey and Magnus trying to brush this off. Mm-hmm. Or whether it's more of their cheater time thing. Whether we're meant to believe it. Because I don't know. Alec kind of seems to believe it at this. You know, Alec's not questioning it. He's not going, well, you haven't. That's not where this conversation is going. So I don't know whether we're meant to believe that they've had this conversation. I don't know. But surely if they had had this conversation any further than I've slept with all sorts of species, then this wouldn't be what's going on right, right. now. Yeah. Alec is so hung up on the kind of minutiae of this box of things i'm not sure that alec is even linking this box of things to a conversation he's had with magnus about no, people he's been with in the past and i think if he did then you know the thing that alec accepted at the end of their date is that magnus has been with a lot of people and that he has a history yeah i don't think he thought about or accepted at that point that magnus has loved people the way Alec now loves Magnus yes. in the past. Yes. And has watched them die. Yeah. And then has moved on to other people. And, and then has loved other people right. again. And yeah. that's what he's getting hung up on. You know, Magnus has always been upfront about the fact that he has a past. That he has 400 years of history and that it would be ridiculous to say that he hadn't experienced most things before. That there was very little that was brand new. Mm. He's always been quite upfront about yeah. that. But that is very, very different from having a box full of mementos of dead mortal lovers. And of course, you do kind of assume that Alec would have drawn those conclusions himself. Absolutely. Totally. And, you know, if you're Magnus, you're not going to sit him down and go, by the way, I love you. But there was also George. Yeah. But there was also George, Steve, Harriet and Jane, yeah. who are also loved the way I yeah. love you, but they're dead totally. now. Totally. But that's not a conversation anyone has. No, absolutely not. And I don't have any issue with Magnus having kind of assumed that saying I've got a lot of history was enough for the time being, that there may be specific aspects of that history that needed further discussion later on down the road, but that he wasn't expected to itemise mm, yeah. his history. I'm totally, totally on board with that. I only rile because he says so explicitly, I have always been honest with you about yes. that. And that is not what he's been honest about. Yes, yeah, no, absolutely. What the problem is, is that he's still distanced from where Alec is struggling with this. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. He's still not recognising the real and actual hurt that his partner is experiencing standing right in front of him right now. Yeah. He's not living in the moment as he tells Alec they must yeah. at the end yeah. of this scene. He's not doing that. No, he's, he's in this nostalgia bubble. He's in this nostalgia bubble. He's behind a wall. He's freaking out mm. because Alec is freaking out about this. I don't know. I, I don't have a clear answer as to why he's doing this, but he is. He's distanced from Alec's pain at the moment. And I'm not suggesting that Alec is absolutely in the right to feel this pain and it's Magnus' responsibility to make him feel better about it necessarily. But there is not a point really in this episode where Magnus gives him anything resembling real comfort or reassurance. Mm. 
Well, there isn't a point where they get somewhere where they can start to have the conversation. Yes. They don't get on the same level at any point. No. Apart from when they brush it under the carpet for now. Right. And it's Magnus who insists on brushing it under the yeah. carpet on both occasions. So at the end of the previous yeah, yeah, scene yeah. and at the end of this scene. You know, what he never says is, look, I can see you're really upset about this. This is why I have this box of things. And this is what it means to me. Not let's go through each itemized <laughs> yeah. item and talk about what it represents. But these are things that I have kept from people I have loved and people who are important to me. And you are important to me. And I'm here with you now. But sometimes it's important to remember my past. Mm. But if it's upsetting you, I can talk to you about it. Yeah. That's- or I can put the box away and we can not talk about it anymore. Which is maybe Less not healthy. something he should offer, maybe. Mm. But... He never offers any kind of consolation at any point. It's just feels consistently like he's telling Alec he's wrong to be upset about this. Or not even telling him he's wrong. Telling him there's nothing to be upset like, about. Yeah. Like it's it's not even engaging that far. Yeah. I feel like we, we sound like we're judging Magnus really harshly and that's not what I mean. I don't you Oh know, god no, he's I'm not just being... trying to get to the bottom right. of Magnus. He's not being cruel, he's not being malicious or mean. No, no. It's just it is very much like the opening bit of three oh one. Yes. It's amazing how far they're emotionally missing each other. Yes, absolutely. And that's what I'm interested in. Yes. And I guess the reason that I keep coming back to Magnus not responding to Alec is because Alec is so clearly confused and in pain and very visibly so. Mm. You know, he's been quite upfront about the fact that he's confused and in pain. That all kind of Magnus needs to do is say, I get that you're confused and in pain. Yeah. You know, we get to the end of this episode and it's clear that this is a conversation they're not done having yet. Yeah, and that of course. we will pick it up next episode. That's fine. But he's kind of oblivious to the pain almost Mm. it's just really odd and as you say they are just missing each other emotionally by miles and magnus is the only one with the kind of emotional stability in this episode to do anything about that i guess is what it comes down to and then alec goes and breaks my heart alec says now i've seen some of that history with my own eyes i can't help but think that i'll be lucky if i end up as an arrowhead in that box one day yeah and we get that beautiful cut out of the camera to the side view with that big pillar between them. Yes. Yeah. It's, which is it's just... Gorgeous. It's also... It is so ostentatious. Yeah. It's literally like you bought restricted viewing theatre tickets. I watched it and I kind of felt myself ducking left and right mm-hmm. to look around it. Mm-hmm. And it's just brilliant. Yeah. But the thing that just kills me about it is the fact that Alex says, if I'm lucky. Yeah. He is still so insecure in this relationship and yeah. it's suddenly all coming out because of everything that's happened today. Yes. And it just kills me. Yeah. Magnus says, I don't even want to think about you being gone. Alex says, well, one day I will be. Mm-hmm. And then he's out of line. Oh, totally. Saying, and he'll just move on. He's hurting, he's upset, he's confused. Magnus isn't giving him anything, but wow. Yeah. And Magnus snaps. Magnus blows up, yeah. And I don't think we've ever seen Magnus do that before. No. Not short of, like, against Iris Rouse when he was actually throwing magical fireballs at her. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. I don't think we've ever actually seen Magnus angry, outright angry. I think the kind of most kind of raised voice active engagement we had was when Alec was beating up Raphael. Yes. But the thing that makes it different is that situation demanded it. Yes, he needed to shout to be heard. Yeah. It's the fact that they're both standing very close to each other, facing each other, and he blows up in his face. Yes. And again, like, I get it. Alec is out of line and he snaps. Alec is out of line. And he's absolutely right to be angry. But it's interesting that where they've been missing each other completely emotionally in this conversation, that's clearly been frustrating, Magnus. Mm Mm-hmm. I mean, it just makes the whole thing more confusing because that kind of means that he's been attempting to understand and failing to understand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is weird because it's really simple and straightforward why Alec is in pain and why he's confused. That's so obvious, you know, from our perspective, Mm. that it seems kind of bizarre that Magnus could have been attempting to understand and attempting to explain this conversation and failing and therefore getting frustrated about it. Like, was that really what was going on in his head? I'm not sure how much of it is frustration, though. And how much of it is just anger at Alex's reaction, anger at the blunt way in which he 
puts the facts. Can't... I'm going to die and you're going to have to deal with it and you will. You're going to move on. Yeah. And how much of it is just frustration at the cards they've been dealt? Maybe. I mean, I can't help but think that if the anger came out of literally just from what Alex says mm-hmm, right mm-hmm. then, from I won't always be and you'll move on, there would be more shock in his yes. response, that it would be more like outrage yeah he snaps or literally the reaction him... would be get out how dare you yes yeah but you can see him snap it's frustration it, it's yes. frustration that causes him to snap but i'm just not sure it's frustration at alec i think it's frustration at the fact that he's been doing really well living in a moment ignoring the fact that he's giving his heart away to another mortal and he's gonna be in a situation where he's gonna have to put him in that box yeah and alec is just putting it all out there yeah, yeah, maybe. With his classic bluntness. And maybe that explains the emotional dissonance as well. Mm. You know, maybe that explains why Magnus is missing him so completely, because he actually cannot think about it. He's so busy compartmentalising yeah. and trying to not allow himself to think of it. And I think that's backed up by the fact that he says, I'm immortal and you're not and neither of us can change that. Yes. I think that's the bit he's frustrated at. Yes. It is so interesting that Alec doesn't really respond to being yelled at. He, yeah, doesn't blink. That is, it kind of makes sense. But yeah, you know. and his insulter stance while he happens. Yep. He's a warrior. He's kind used of like to it. Outright displays of aggression are kind of par for the course. But it is mm. interesting that he's so like tightly wound up in his own head that even Magnus yelling at him, and Magnus has never yelled at him before. No. Like, the only other time we've heard Magnus raise his voice to friends and loved ones is in that scene with Alec beating up Raphael. And Alec wouldn't have heard that. No. But also he wasn't yelling at him. He was raising his voice. But Magnus is yelling at him. It's like, that's a big thing. Like, the first time somebody actually yells at you, that's a big deal. Yeah. Or it certainly is, in my experience, anyway. Absolutely. Like, in, you know, in a friendship, in a relationship, like any of it, your first big fight and it's not just a disagreement you did a thing and i'm angry with you and now i'm gonna not gonna talk to you for three days the first big fight like all out claws and shouting fight that's a big deal yeah and it's a really important thing to go through in a relationship because you need to know how you deal with that yes and what kind of human beings you both are and how you find your way back together afterwards yeah we ever seen alec yell did he shout at jace I mean, we've obviously seen the fight between Alec and Jace. He decks him, but he's also yelling at him quite a lot. But again, it's a physical fight. It's a physical fight. fight. It's, it's not a the same situation. thing. It's not an argument. But does Alec yell? He snaps. He snaps and he snarks. You know, back when Jace was missing and he was at the end of every mm. tether he had, he was definitely... And he snapped at Magnus. Snapping at people, yeah, snarling yeah, at people. Yelling. But I don't think he's ever actually raised his voice. Mm. One at the moment I'm thinking of, you know, when he disowns Jace from the family. It's chilly, it's cold. It's not loud. So, yeah, no, I I can't think of a time. Mm. Do let us know if we're wrong. Yeah. I'm just interested in kind of where Mm. Alec is in terms of... Because his mother certainly doesn't shout. No. She is cold. Cold and clipped and, yeah. You have to assume that his father doesn't shout. His dad is very soft-spoken and passive to the point of, you know... Might as well not exist. Right. Yeah. Jace has yelled at him. I was going to say Jace yells. I don't think he yells. Jace yelled at him on a roof at the end of 103. Hmm. He did. And I was right in his face. And Alec didn't even Alec turned and he walked away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just... I have no conclusion to draw from all of this musing. It's just interesting in terms of we have a really good sample of Alex's entire family and social circle Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. up till this point. Yeah. It's interesting to note his context in terms of his response to things, especially because we have so little context for Magnus's. But it's interesting that Alex doesn't respond to being yelled at. He doesn't blink. He doesn't even change his expression. No, no, literally he's just waiting until... He's done. Yeah. Yeah. Magnus gets himself under control pretty much immediately. He says, can we just 
stay in the here and now and that he wants to cherish this moment with the one he loves, which is the most wordy obfuscation I think we've ever heard from Magnus. Like, that is the most roundabout way of saying I love you that I think we've ever had. Yeah, yeah. And it's really ostentatious. And it's a really weird yes. way of saying it. I mean, the whole thing is weird and deliberately so. You oh, know, totally. All of the moments between them that we've had that we've sort of said, oh, that's a little bit like awkward when it shouldn't be awkward. Mm. This is all intentional. Yeah, Everything absolutely. that is going on in this interaction is intentional. The fact that Magnus goes, let's just live in the here and now. I want to cherish this moment with the one I love and steps forward and grasps Alec by the front of his jacket whilst Alec is still in parade rest Mm -hmm. is really striking. Yeah. I think this may be the first time that Magnus has touched Alec and not had immediate reciprocation. Yeah, 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 yeah. Or that Alec's actually started it. Because there's been a couple of times now when Magnus has initiated physical interaction. Certainly kind of hand on neck, like all of those things. But I think up until now, every time he's done it, Alex immediately turned into it. Yeah, yeah. Relaxed into it, responded to it physically, and he really doesn't. He allows Magnus to step into his space, but it takes a good few beats before he responds physically. I adore Harry's kind of hesitatey hand before he puts his hand on Alex's chest. Mm, Yeah, I mean, I love the fact that he starts with Alex putting his hand on Magnus's neck. Yeah. And Magnus holding onto his hand, and then Alex slips his hand away. Yep. And he does that moment of having his hand kind of floating in air, moving his fingers around, clearly not knowing what to do with it. Yep. And then, yeah, he does the little hesitating and then the pat because, good, okay, we're <laughs> let's, fine. Let's do that then. Like, yeah. You're, you're not fine. And he says, I'll be right back with those martinis. Like, yeah. let's resume our evening as if this never happened, kind of a thing. And then Alec does the face. Alec smiles. Alec, whose hand has gone up to Magnus's neck and then immediately return to parade rest Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Alec turns his back on the room and we leave the scene on his face looking so not okay I want to cry yeah he's so messed up about this yeah as he should be this is confusing and complicated and they desperately need to have a conversation about this in which they're both honest and even tempered yeah yeah because yeah things came out in this conversation and the fact that Magnus snapped isn't great but the things he snapped about are the facts yeah and they need to have this conversation yeah and yes maybe slightly less than two months is too early to have that conversation but Alex at a point where he's ready to move in with him so clearly Alex needs to have that conversation and he needs to be aware of it there's also whether they're ready to have that conversation or no circumstances have progressed to the point where the conversation's sort of been started without them yeah 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 you're now having it right and that's not just because Alec caught him looking into a nostalgia box Mm. this morning really interesting scene really meaty scene and I still feel like there's stuff that we've not covered no I feel we could talk about this for a long time yeah and I'm actually really looking forward to talking about this in the 3A roundup my god yes when we've got the entire thing yeah and yeah it's got to be yeah. awesome really interesting we'll be here for hours really interesting but for the moment we must move on to Isabel and Charlie at the hospital cheerful 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 Charlie's doing her stitches and he says well that wasn't so bad was it she said no it actually kind of tickled and he said oh you've never had stitches before and she goes no I've never needed them which is really nice it's a it's nice little awesome yeah. Izzy is super adorable in this yeah yeah she is Charlie says that he's sorry for coming on too strong she says you didn't he says well you kind of tried to run away earlier and (laughs) (laughs) I sort of (laughs) took that as a hint and she said no I really did have to work and I really do have to work now so I've got to go and he looks a little sad like Mm. maybe this was running away after all she turns around and says why did you come after me which I really like yeah Yeah, I like the kind of because that's a question right that's like especially in regards to you thinking he's a bit creepy yes why did he follow her and he says because all of these killings and I was worried and I just had to make sure that you got home safe 
And the thing that I love is that he says because of all of those cult member murders, yeah, that he's clearly picked up on, you know, what the newspapers are calling it. Yep. Really nice through thread from earlier. She kisses him on the cheek and says, Thank you for the stitches. Yes. Which I'd like to, because Izzy does not need saving by anybody. No. Nice. But she quite enjoyed the stitches because they tickle. Yeah. Also, hang on to this one. I mean, healthcare on the house. Right. Yes. Dude. Yes. And how adorable is it that she tries to pay him yeah. and she doesn't know where the front desk is and where the tills are? <laughs> it's just so cute. Yeah, the whole thing is so cute. We cut over to Luke and Cleophus who are waiting for Clary in the farmhouse and Luke is not patient. No. No. And Cleophus says, oh, you remember that time when there was a dog next door and you were really scared of the dog and I told you you had to have a little faith and so you walked past the dog and the dog licked you. Luke was scared of a dog and the dog licked him. <laughs> Which is about the most adorable story that any of us have ever heard. So happy. Really, really cute. I mean, we needed all of this saccharine rot your teeth sweetness after that. Yes. But I think the tonal shift really works. I think it does too. Yeah. I can't remember whether I've actually said at any point in the podcast, we've been talking for quite a long time now, I've <laughs> lost track a little bit, but this episode does suffer from some of that bittiness that mm. we had last episode. Some of the tonal shifts work better than others and I actually think this one works pretty well. I think the kind of tension and like slightly background anxiety making nature of all of Magnus and Alex's scenes this mm-hmm. episode work quite well in contrast to the lighter sweeter things yeah 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 I wonder how much of that background anxiety is your reason for disliking Charlie maybe <laughs> yeah mm. bleeds through yeah maybe I don't know how do you all feel about Charlie let us know are you all convinced he's going to die because I am <laughs> Cleophus thinks that Luke needs to have faith in Clary. And this is an interesting, this faith thing. It's something that we've talked about a little bit in terms of sort of shadow hunter culture before Mm -hmm, this idea of mm -hmm. faith and certainly it kind of goes back to that idea of the iron sisters as a very like religious sort of subsect of the shadow hunters they are nuns to the silent brothers monks and certainly cleophus has textually exhibited more faith than any of our other characters yeah absolutely so it's kind of interesting having that discussion being one with her in this scene now but the idea that they have to have faith in Clary is interesting and kind of I wonder whether part of that is to do with Clary having kind of been elevated in Cleophus's mind by her angel blood. I mean it was certainly explained the greeting that she gave right, her. That Clary is close to angels and therefore needs to be revered yeah. I guess. Well he's also Luke isn't worried about Clary messing this up. Luke's worried about the angels smiting her. Yes. So he doesn't need to have faith in Clary he needs to have faith in the situation and right. that Claire is going to be okay. Yes. He's not worried that Claire is going to say the wrong thing and no. take off the angel. It would be interesting to see what Cleophus' response to Jace was mm-hmm. at this mm-hmm. point, you know, in, in light of that. Well, she might be back at some point. Who knows? She's not dead. Speaking of Clary, we cut over to her. Ethereal arrives. He does. And in a big glowy ball of angel. In a big glowy ball of angel that turns the world to day, which is a really beautiful effect. Yes, which I totally did not notice the first yeah. time watching it. I just thought that we'd gone from night time and she'd been there all night and it was now dawn. Yep, no. Nope. But yeah. It's literally with the angel. She says, all this stuff happened with Jace and I'm really worried about him and I don't know what to do. And was it me? Did I cause him to come back this way? And Ethereal says, no. It Mm. wasn't the actual being brought back that made him this way, but being brought back made him vulnerable, which is really interesting. And that's not an idea that's unique to Shadowhunters. There's quite a lot of other reincarnation or reanimation stories in which you are at risk of bringing something back with you Mm -hmm. from Mm -hmm. the other side, that it leaves you open to bad influences, negative influences. Um, I really like the way he says no. Yeah. It is such a complete... No, obviously not. Like, he doesn't even pause to think about it. What I really like about that no is that it kind of resonates for me in a way that we should always have known that it wasn't the act of being brought back because Raziel brought him back. Yeah, it was done by an angel. The angel brought him back. Yeah, absolutely. And there may have been like side effects and other things that happened afterwards, but the actual reanimation, that was an angel Mm. and therefore kind of has to be working the way the angel said it would, I guess. Absolutely, absolutely. It has to do what it says on the tin, that's sort of part of the deal. Yeah, yeah. Also, you've got one wish. Yeah, no, totally. Surely Raziel doesn't get to cheat you 
you on that. No, no, absolutely. It's just that the things that happen around bringing someone back from the dead, he can't change the rules. No. But, yeah, there kind of has to be nothing wrong with Jace himself. Right, but I like how matter-of-fact it is. It's really nice. We also get when the angel lands, he says, I'm here for you, my child. Yeah. And I like the wording on that because she kind of literally is. Yeah. And when she says... Do you know about the stuff that's going on? He kind of says yes, as in, oh yeah, me and Brazil were chatting. <laughs> which is kind of cute. What a cooler moment. <laughs> yeah. Clary surmises that the sort of great darkness that Jace has invited is the owl. And Ethereal says the owl has a master. Which is nicely worded again, actually. I like yep. I like yep. a lot of Ethereal's dialogue. He says, their name is... <laughs> <laughs> and then his heart gets torn out of his chest or pushed through his chest from behind. Punched through his... Yeah. Punched it's through really the back. gruesome and graphic. Yep. Yeah. This is kind of what my heart felt like in the earlier Malik scene. <laughs> Yeah. I feel there's going to be quite a lot of gifts of that moment with some Malig puns on it. Mm, mm, mm. Nice. So it's all horrific. And then he blows up. He blows up and night returns to the wood, which yeah. is it just, it's beautiful. Yeah, it kind of says really sad things about, you know, my brain that I didn't catch that. Because, <laughs> yeah, it's gorgeous. Especially because you get that massive blast of light yeah. and then darkness. Yeah. And standing before Clary is... Big dragon. Lilith the big dragon. Yep. Big dragon with a very smushy face. Yes. She severs a slice of Clary's soul or whatever it is she was supposed to be doing. Yep. Clary passes out. Clary passes out. As previously discussed, one suspects this is more to do with the inelegance of the um, operation than the actual yeah. soul extraction. No, itself, I think that's totally fair. Given that Magnus was the one who advocated for the soul slicing. In a casual way. Right. Um, we cut to Clary, who's waking up back in the farmhouse. Um, Clear first asks whether Ethereal turns up. Um, Clary says, Ethereal! And sort of cries. Yeah, I like that we don't get her telling them. We don't get yeah, their reaction, well, we, like all of that. Know, we, don't we don't need, need it. it. We no, don't need totally. it. We've just seen it. Really nice. Um, we cut over to... Kyle. We cut over to Kyle in Simon and Kyle's flat. Now, I was so confused. Because we get the tappy boots, yes. and then we get the twitchy hands, and yes. we get the bead bracelet. Yes. And I thought that was... Alec having put on one of Magnus's bracelets right? Yeah, and yeah. now panicking and freaking out over what's going on and where they are and all of that. I don't know why. He's never worn hiking boots like yeah, no, that. It's like they're totally not Alec's shoes. No, no. And the bead bracelet, you know, is very Magnus, but he's also very Stoner Kyle. <laughs> Surfer boy Stoner Kyle. Yeah. But yeah, there was just a moment of me that was like, oh my God, Alex freaking out and he's put on Magnus's bracelet because he's really sad. What? <laughs> that would, Brain? That what? would change my object irrelevance yeah. <laughs> completely. <laughs> really ruin your possession yeah, theory. Yeah. But it's fine. It's Kyle. <laughs> it's Kyle. Simon turns up and is getting his keyboard and wants to borrow the Les Paul and pretty much says that he'll accept Kyle's help, but only on his own terms, that he's not going to be held hostage by anybody. I love Simon. So much love. Simon is I love awesome Simon. in this scene. He's brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. Just this whole thing is just beautiful. Yeah. I just love how he's taking control of his life. Yes. And he's like, yeah, it's great. You can do your thing. But you're doing it while I'm marching over there and playing yeah, a gig. Totally. It's just great. And then we cut over to Parapawo. And then we cut over to Parapawo. We cut over to Alec in his office. And he's clearly had a martini with Magnus and then left. And isn't that interesting and significant mm. on the day when he asked if he could move in? Yeah. That this is the first night in God and he knows how long that he's not spent at the loft. Yeah, absolutely. Jace comes in, says, you got a minute. Alec sort of... Says, yeah, in a distracted, heartbroken kind of a way. He's so not doing anything to disguise how distraught mm, he is. Yeah. And obviously this is Jace. This isn't, you know, this isn't Underhill. This isn't, like, any random person. This yeah, is. Yeah, yeah. But for Alec to be this out of control in this office, I think is quite significant. And in his office with his ongoing open-door policy. Yeah. Where anyone could walk by. Yeah. Yeah. And see him that vulnerable. Yeah. Jace asks if he's okay. Okay, which my god yeah good on you i mean beautiful like i i love how much peace jace seems to have found by the end of this episode mm-hmm, mm-hmm. that that kind of resigned anxiety that we got from him at the beginning has sort of softened and mellowed he's got a plan it seems like this is the first time that jace has really had the 
energy to care about somebody else since mm-hmm. the beginning of the mm-hmm. season. Yeah. You know, this is the first moment where he's actually looked at the person across from him with anything. It's difficult because he and Clary have obviously had a few moments in this season. Mm-hmm. But she was so aware of what was going on with him that he could kind of be distracted and be in the moment with her simultaneously. Yeah. It also very much felt like he was deliberately focusing on her to not focus on the other thing. Whereas this feels very much like a, like he's resolved whatever's going on with him for the moment. You know, that he's he's at peace with it for the moment. And that that means he has the energy to focus only on Alec in this moment. There's a really beautiful, peaceful quality about yeah, 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 yeah. He's got a plan of action and is able to step outside his own head for yeah, a moment. Yeah, exactly. That was much more succinctly put than all of that rattling <laughs> I was just doing. But yeah, you're welcome. No, beautiful. Alex says it's just stuff with Magnus and he doesn't want to bore Jace with it. Which means I don't want to talk right now. Yeah. And Jace understands. And turns it round on him, says, how are you? And Jace sort of does a little deep breath like yep that's why i came to talk to you Mm -hmm. jace tells him that he's going to go to the silent city for treatment yeah jace acknowledges that it was alec who said he should go for help in the first place and says sorry Mm -hmm. which is Mm -hmm. really really nice it's really nice that that moment of jace snapping at him is textualized as being out of line yeah absolutely that it wasn't just like par for the course this wasn't like the way things are this was a moment in which he was out of line it's understandable but that doesn't mean it's not something he needs to apologise for. Yes. You know, we've been through this yeah. various times in this show. Just because you've got a reason or because someone else is wrong doesn't mean that your actions are just okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Again, I really like what Matthew's doing in his scene. Especially because you had that exact same conversation opening the episode with Clary. Mm-hmm. And Jay says, I'm going to go to the Silent City. And Clary's trying to find all the options in the world that... Yeah she can avoid that and try to tell him that's not what it is that maybe it's something else we can do this we can do this we can do this and the fact that Alec just nods Mm -hmm. because yeah he did suggest it but also yeah this is tough and you know what it might mean and I know what it might mean but yeah you have to yeah and he establishes that Jace is clear on the potential ramifications Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and Jace says I know and at least it'll mean I've tried everything and I think it's important at this point to recognise that if what Clary says is true and he's declared unfit for duty and that means that his runes will be stripped presumably that means that their bond will be broken yeah yeah, yeah, i think it's kind of important in this scene between them to textualize the potential ramifications this means for them together Mm. not just jace alone no absolutely absolutely and that yeah you know he's not asking for permission from alec no but he does need to let him know before he leaves yes because and not just what he might lead to and not just because he's his brother and because he's his commanding officer both of which are reasons yeah that he should tell him that he's going for possibly intense medical treatment somewhere Mm. but that this could have serious personal ramifications for alec alec says i'll come with you and hold your hand (laughs) and jay says and jay sort of goes that's kind of adorable but you can't they won't let you anywhere near it you'd just be kind of waiting outside the door Mm. and him saying that this is something i have to do by myself just breaks my heart well and more than that he says this is one battle i have to face alone yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. What, with all of their parapetai fighting bond? Right. Mm. Right. True, true. Well done, writers. <laughs> it's like they're thinking about this. It's all very sad. And they have a big, squishy parapa hug. They do. And they still do really good hugs, these two. They're, it's beautiful. And I really, really like when we get the close-up of their faces in the hug because they both do the snuggle into next thing. Yeah, no, it's really lovely. We cut over to the Hunter's Moon. Jace is on the phone with Clary. He's telling her about going to the Silent City. He approaches Kyle, who's at the bar, says, has he seen a shadow hunter with long red hair? (laughs) Kyle says, I know who Clary Fry is. Which is funny. (laughs) Which is funny, and that he hasn't seen her. We cut over to Simon, who's on the stage, who starts to play. I really like the bit of acknowledgement you get in this weird triangle relationship without this episode, Mm -hmm. where Simon's calling out Kyle for being his roommate and roadie, and Kyle does this really strange, like he gets up from his bar stool and kind of walks a couple of steps and kind of acknowledges the crowd, (laughs) which is a bit weird. It's like, yes, yes, this is me, this is me. Yeah. And then... Simon and Jace have this really nice yeah. eye contact and little nod. Yeah. There's just really, really nice kind of subtle bits of connection going on. Yeah. I think Simon's line's interesting too, that it was a long road to get here, 
but I made it. Mm. It kind of, that's a mission statement for the episode, isn't yeah, it? Yeah. Like, it was a long road to get here, but I made it. It's like, that's... It's like, no, no, dude, like, you were here at four o'clock to set up and then <laughs> it took you three hours. Right. Yeah, this but, is not what you're talking about. No, but I like that. That we're kind of textualising it. Yeah. yeah. Jace is at the bar. Lilith in Anna Hopkins form yeah. <laughs> appears next to him. More casually dressed than we've seen her thus far. Yeah. She's, well, she was she's, out for a night on the town. Yeah, dressed to blend in. She asks him to buy her a drink. He says, I'm not sure my girlfriend would like that very much. And she says, ha ha ha, well, you seem to be the only person who's getting service around here. There's only two people at the bar. Which seems a little <laughs> whatever, but okay. So he buys her a drink. Which he doesn't pay for. No. And she doesn't give him money for. No. I don't know whether, like, this is just, you know, his 10th pint that day and the 10th one's free. <laughs> or whether he's got an open tap. But It's possible he's got a tab. And then she roofies him. Yeah. So she roofies him. He Good. takes a sip of his beer. She says, how do you feel? And he says, like a new man. Yeah. The end. The end. The end of the episode. I'm a little bit confused how falling out of love with Clary is turning him into the owl. I don't know. I just really wish that he took a drink, kind of did his, you know, freezy moment, which is fine because clearly stuff's rearranging in your brain. Yeah. And she just went to sleep. Yes. Because she can then talk to him. Yes. Without... It's just really weird because what should happen is that he should be reset to season one, episode one. I mean, no, not necessarily season one, episode one, because all of the stuff that's happened to him still has happened to him. But it just shouldn't... It shouldn't turn him into the owl, It shouldn't no. turn him into the owl, which no, is clearly what he is. I mean, what I'd have liked, what would have been neat, given the way their interaction started, is if he'd taken a sip of his beer... And then hit on her. And then hit on her. No, totally. Yeah. That would have been the nifty, elegant way of doing and it. she might be slightly out of his age bracket, but that doesn't mean he wouldn't have flirted with her, even if he wasn't going to go anywhere. She's he's very, a flirt. He's a flirt and she's very pretty. Yeah, like, she's like very a, attractive. One, you wouldn't, like, hesitate about, you know, you, don't, you didn't hesitate about their flirty interaction at the beginning of this exchange. No, like, totally. He turned her down, but in a very kind of like, ah, oh, if only I was single, I totally would. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, yeah, absolutely. That's the thing, isn't it? He yeah. goes, oh, I would love to, but, but... Yes. Yeah, no, it would have been so much neater if he'd gone, hello, yeah. who are you? Yeah. Except, you know, more sexy than that, right. he's quite good at this. Yeah. yeah. That would have been neat, but that's not what they did. He's a new man. Um, he's a new man. Okay. With no um, memory of nothing. So apparently now he doesn't love Clary? That's what we're to take from yep. this? Yep. Good. Why do I get the feeling that that's not quite how it's going to work? I mean, because <laughs> endgame OTP and all of that. That's one. Yeah. But also, Magnus made the potion. Yes. Which is really handy for all of our themes and creepiness and the threat and all of that but also ultimately means it's Magnus's magic yes 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 he can undo it totally yeah I mean I think that's where we're going with this surely mm, yeah I, I assume so I'd also kind of hope that it would mean that Magnus could also sense it but he's not good at sensing stuff at the moment so no, no. who knows I mean possibly if Jace is untidy then he would notice that he's not in order but other than that nothing yeah so yeah so that was the episode <laughs> Went on for a while. It did. I think this one's longer than normal episodes. I think this might be <laughs> longer than normal episodes. Certainly our episode is longer than normal episodes. Yeah. Well, we've had some long ones. Yeah. So apart from Jace, have you got anything that we need to circle back to? I don't think so, because I think we've covered the Magnus Alec as much as is coverable. I mean, I think that's probably not Throw true. Throw a big blanket <laughs> on it. I think that's probably not true, but I think we'll probably have more to say about that next week. So. Yeah. But yeah, so, soldier theme. So, Jace, yeah. Because I mean, that's the thing, is like, there's Jace, but also the general soldier theme. Yes, yeah. So, there's a really interesting thing happening in this episode, which is just that kind of reiteration of not just that Jace is a soldier and not a leader, but mm -hmm. that Jace is a really good good soldier yeah he's really good at what he does what he does well he's truly exceptionally good at mm. and that's really important i think to have sort of reiterated especially at this point when you know ultimately he's been a pretty useless member of the shadow hunting team yes so absolutely far. but also at this point when he's so close to losing that. Right, yes, absolutely, absolutely. Because we talked about this from the start, you know, literally of episode one, pretty much, that Jay's really loves what he does. Mm -hmm. And a lot of what he loves is the bit where he can go out and risk his life and steal motorbikes and be crazy. But just generally, he loves being a soldier. Yeah. And it's something that we talked about in The World Inverted as well, that kind of, how did he end up being a coffee boy? That's weird, but it's just... 
he really gets stuck into what he does. Yes. And he loves being good at stuff. And he's really quite driven and wants to achieve things. Yeah. Well, it's also interesting that aside from the kind of soldieriness we had throughout the Simon Kyle plot line, but also that adherence to structure and authority and that kind of thing, mm -hmm. aside from that, we also had this parabatai scene right at the end yep. which I just every time I see them talk to each other since Alec became head of the institute their costuming contrast is just so striking yeah. to me yeah it really is you know it used to be pre to be whatever episode it was in which Alec actually became head of the institute yeah. that their costumes were near identical yeah 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 and yeah, now, combat outfits and you know t-shirts and leather jackets and thigh holsters, thigh holsters and combat Sarah boots blades, and fingerless gloves. Yeah. And now you have these scenes with them standing next to each other, mm. and Alec is in blazers and button-up shirts and dress shoes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Jace looks like he always looked. Yeah, yeah. And it's just it's just so striking. Jace is continuously ready for action. Right. It's such a, like, easy, simple visual representation mm -hmm. of their mm -hmm. roles within this institution and their, their roles in regards to each other professionally. No, totally. And in that same vein, I really like the fact that Jace is coming into his office to tell his brother, his friend, his parapet but also his commanding officer. Yep. And it's yeah. all wrapped into one because that's how their relationship works. Yes, yes. So that just kind of doubled down on this whole Jace's soldier thing mm -hmm, for me in this mm -hmm. episode. But um, let's kind of just take it through scene by scene, I guess, in terms of the moments that I felt like this was particularly prominent. So the first kind of thing that I noted was that first scene in uh, Simon and Kyle's apartment when he's on duty immediately. Yeah. Like, he's taken Simon's case. Whether Simon wants him to take the case <laughs> yeah. or not, he has taken Simon's case. Simon's case is now Jace's case. And Jace sets himself quests. We know Jace sets mm. himself quests. This is the way he works. And this is the investigative period of his quest. Yeah, like, I mean, I think there's something very sweetly kind of crime investigation story. Yes. You know, or... Sherlock Holmes. Yes. He walks into this room and Simon is nattering and trying to distract him with playing PlayStation. That's not what Jace is there for. No. Jace is literally scanning the room. He's deducing. for yeah. odd stuff. Yeah. yeah, he's deducing. And he's deducing after having done a considerable amount of legwork in mm -hmm. walking all mm -hmm. the way to the Jade Wolf to ask them about it. Yeah, like, totally. He could have just called Luke or Maya. Yeah, you know, and made them talk to the pack. Right. But he didn't. He walked all the way there himself so he could do the investigation properly. And also so he could do it now. Yes, yes, absolutely. And then he's doing all of this investigation stuff in the apartment. And as we said at the time, I love how quick he is, how yeah. smart he is, how observant he is. And the way in which I think we noticed how perfect Kyle and the apartment were for Simon, but didn't necessarily see that as sinister until Jace presented it as sinister. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, you know, even if you knew after the end of the previous episode that Kyle was a bit of a creep, I don't think it became obvious that the whole thing was such a clear and specific setup until Jace walks around touching every item that strikes yeah. him as suspect. Like, this one and this one and this one and this one and this one. They're yeah, out yeah, of place. Yeah. They shouldn't be here. They're here for you. Yeah. This and is it's like weird. It's like every time he touches something... It lights up. It lights up and, yeah. and you notice it. In big neon warning danger signs. In a way signs. that when Simon entered the flat before, it was just like... It was just a cool flat. Boy Haven Paradise. Nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, oh, look, bikes and games and music and Because stuff. they're both the same age right. and they like the same stuff. Right. Just, I thought, beautifully done. The next instant of this kind of, like, ostentatious soldierness is obviously in the next scene in Simon and Kyle's apartment, the one that ends with the confrontation. Mm -hmm. And he's doing that snooping thing still, you know, he's still doing that investigative thing. And the sort of casual breaking into Kyle's bedroom. and Yeah, totally. Because he's on the job. Because he's on the job, yeah. And... There's more evidence behind that door. I, I like how kind of 
fixated on his mission he is simon is prattling yeah simon yeah. prattles throughout this entire sequence and is going oh no no no, you can't do that that's his you know private room and da, 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 and, and don't pick that thing up put it down stop sniffing that yeah and jace is like no i'm i'm on a mission i've got mm. things to deduce and i have a theory because he clearly does have a yeah, theory yeah, by that point and everything he's finding is backing that theory up all he's looking for is the damning evidence right exactly which he finds and then confronts kyle and then there's that fascinating shift when it's revealed that kyle is in proto lupus hmm he is also a soldier. He's also a soldier. He's part of the system. Yeah. Like, whatever Protolupus are, they're clearly an accepted system. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're a thing that and exists. Certainly, Jace's explanation of what the Praetor are is talking about the fact that they step in on downworld business. Yep. It's not werewolf business, it's downworld down business. Downworld business, yeah. Which means that they're kind of helping the Clave. They're helping the Shadow Hunters in so far as the shadow hunter's official goals yeah of keeping peace and stopping, yeah, yeah, yeah like yes yes but he stands down and he literally stands mm. down soldier style like but you know i love when he stands down and he says no dude he's just doing his job which for jace is the thing yeah because we talked way back in season one and we've talked about it since as well about jace's rebellion really being about efficiency Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. that what he wants is to be able to do his job yeah and he's quite committed to doing his job and to doing his job effectively and he really hates people getting in his way when he's just trying to do yes, his job yes and the amount of respect he has for other people trying to do their jobs is interesting mm. and i touched on in the scene that sort of sense of mediation that you get from jace and he is he's very very passive but he's not not paying attention. Yeah, he's not disinterested. He's not, you know, solved the problem and turns out everything's fine right. and he might as well be leaving. We've also seen Jace go from physically very at ease to being at action. Mm hmm turn on a dime you know we've seen that change happen with him before that he's perfectly capable of going from lounging against sofas to being back with a blade against yeah, yeah, yeah. if the situation calls for it totally. you know the fact that jace is relaxed does not mean he's not gonna kill you in three seconds if right. he has to. this is what he's good at this is yeah. what he's capable of this is what he's designed for and then we get this interesting thing when he talks to simon when simon's busking mm-hmm. about accepting the help that's been offered to him which whilst that's absolutely 100% an echo of the help that he's planning on seeking from the Simon brothers and that's sort of his personal situation of the suggestion that Alec made and he didn't take right there's absolutely that echo but I think there's also an echo of accepting the role of the system yeah Mm -hmm. that this is the system this is a established authority and system that has a place for you within its hierarchy yeah within in its bureaucracy there is room for you they have a system in place to help people like you and they may not be going about it the perfect way but they are trying to help yes trust in the system hmm and that's interesting too. Yeah, yeah. And we've seen that from Jace before, that fundamentally it may not be ideal, but the system is in place for a reason and the system works. Well, we've talked about it at some point, and I can't remember when, probably earlier today, because, hey, went on for hours, <laughs> about the fact that Jace has probably never stopped to question the system mm-hmm. because it doesn't occur to him that that's something he should be doing or something he has the power to do anything about. Right, yeah, yeah. He does believe in the system. Yeah. And while he's aware that it might be flawed, it's like he's trying to find ways to work and exist within it. Yes. Even within the flawed system. Yes, yes, absolutely. It never would occur to him to break the system. Yeah. This is not about questioning the status quo. This is about living with the status quo and finding the way in which it works for you. Yes, yes. I think that's something that's carried through the seasons. Yeah, totally. Just generally a really interesting episode for Jace and a really nice emotional art arc for him I think I don't think we've had such a sort of neat emotional arc since 211 for Jace mm. I'm really impressed by the amount of peace he found by the end of this episode and how organic that felt like considering how messed up and turbulent he and his life have been over mm-hmm. the past few episodes mm-hmm. it could really have felt like it came out of nowhere yeah. this kind of peace and resolution he found or but that it... he's in a completely different storyline right but it felt completely natural it felt completely earned you know my, my heart kind of 
broke for him at the end because obviously he did everything right apart from not watch his drink in a public bar right and we all know how important that is Obviously, things between him and Clary may suffer for this, but I ultimately think, you know, they are the OTP. They're, they're going to be OK. Yeah, but I yeah, kind yeah. of think maybe this is going to derail Jace's seeking of help with his mental health. Mm-hmm. This is kind of my issue with the fact that he takes the roofied drink and turns into the owl. Mm-hmm. Because forgetting his love of Clary isn't going to make any difference to his decision over wanting to go to the silent city to fix his mental health yes i don't feel he's going to because he took that drink and turned into a mindless robot yes i mean i guess the implication is that the only thing that was keeping lilith from having full control over him was his love for clary yes that's kind of the implication we got from last episode. And to be fair, she did say to us that she can only control him when he's asleep because of his love for Clary. Yes. Ergo, he no longer loves her. Yes. 24-7 control. Yes. So just being near her or... Something, yeah. Yeah. I think it just comes down to the fact that we don't know how she's controlling him. Right. Whether she actually has to do something. Right. And whether she can turn it off so he can still pretend to be a normal person yeah, and yeah, infiltrate yeah. the system. I mean, presumably she can. I would hope so. Yeah. Pretty useless power if she can't. Yeah. I mean... I mean, kind of no, because she only wants him to go and fetch people and, you know, hellfire into their faces. She doesn't actually want to get into the Institute. She doesn't care. Well, no, except then why Jace? Because he killed her boy? Well, yes, no, I understand why punish Jace with this. Mm. But if you don't want Jace to remain at least some part of Jace, then... Punishing him is kind of pointless. Punishing him is kind of pointless. Mm. Then you've already killed him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it's like, if this is, as far as Lilith's concerned anyway, the end of Jace Herondale, that she now has the owl... Yeah, 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 forever. Then she just killed him, and that's the end of any revenge Mm. that she might have been trying to exact. We also don't know whether she's got any kind of plans for, just generally, but for him also after the whole 33 disciples thing yeah yeah yeah. like we don't know if there's any use for him after that yeah well it'd be quite neat if she at any point said that you know his blood is the last blood jonathan needs no uh, maybe or something yeah, yeah. like that yeah but then we don't know how the 33 disciples work no exactly i think at this point we have not enough information to sort of judge any of that which by the way i've got some even more badly googled vague follow-up on go okay. that there's multiple kind of papers studies maths in regards to how many children Adam and Eve had. And it seems to be generally accepted that they had 33 boys. Okay. And 23 daughters. So obviously it makes absolutely no <laughs> sense whatsoever because the disciples are male and female. I enjoy that you're still but, still struggling to find rhyme or reason with this. bugs me. Yeah. bugs me. Yeah, I know. So here's another number okay. theory cool. that's even vaguer than the cool. previous ones. Is there anything else or shall we do best bits... MVPs, quotes, and then stop talking. I think that's probably should. all. Yeah. What was your best bit? It's really difficult, this episode, I think, because loads of the Magnus and Alex stuff was really powerful, mm-hmm. really meaty. Like, I love how much stuff stuff was going on in yeah, yeah, yeah. in those scenes and how much like how much we've talked out of it and I still feel like there's more stuff we could we could get out of those scenes but you know I didn't enjoy either of the scenes particularly they yeah. were kind of painful and horrific yep so I can hardly say oh yes they're my best bits well if it helps at all mine's not malik based my best bit is Simon taking charge of his life on his terms. So that final scene in... Where he um, tells Kyle to grab some cables because he's going to be a roadie if he wants to. <laughs> pray to him. Yeah. That was very much a punch the air kind of a moment. Y- yeah, no, absolutely. I guess it's just, it's difficult because I have absolutely no doubt that, that what I will remember from this episode is those Magnus and Alex scenes. Totally. That that's the weight of this episode. And they had a tough job this week, Matt and Harry. And for the most part, did exceptionally well. Mm-hmm. 
like blindingly well. So on the basis that I'm having to kind of eliminate all of the Magnus and Alec <laughs> because dude. This is rubbish. <laughs> Cause, no, because because dude, because weighty and complicated, and you can't. I cannot. I cannot pick a single moment out of that and say that moment. That moment, I think, was the best moment of this entire episode, even though it was depressing as all get out. And if you've picked that Simon moment, which I agree was brilliant, I'm gonna go for Luke getting licked by a dog. <laughs> <laughs> I was hoping you would, but I didn't think you would. I loved that bit. It was adorable and sweet. And I liked the the whole scene between mm-hmm. Luke and Cleophas, yeah, yeah, yeah. but also felt like a kind of pure moment of uncomplicated good in an episode which is otherwise very very complicated also a moment of memory and nostalgia that's not depressing yes absolutely which is yeah. nice yeah in an episode that is full of complicated weighty depressing nostalgia mm. yeah, yeah yeah having a reminiscence that's you just know, pure joyful and is, sweet is really lovely yeah also he was scared of the dog and then he got licked of the dog and now he's a werewolf yes I like no it. longer scared of dogs yeah no it's just nice and Isaiah's delivery of the final line yeah. of the story is just beautiful. There is something so, so delightful about seeing a man that big and butch and manly going, he licked me. <laughs> That's what happened. <laughs> he licked me in the, the face. The puppy licked me in the face. <laughs> <laughs> totally. Who's your MVP this week? Matthew. Good. I'm glad. I'm not going to go into it as to why. No, no. His performance is beautiful. Yeah. And complicated and nuanced. And oniony. Oniony. And very different from anything we've seen him do before, mm. whilst maintaining consistency of character. Just really beautiful work. Really, really beautiful work. What about you? I'm having a war with myself this week. I am tearing my head to pieces trying to work out. Matt's wonderful in this ep. Major, major plaudits. He is, but I already picked him. Deserved. You him. But you already picked him, so I'll pick somebody else. So I'm going to pick Simon Lewis, who hasn't got an MVP from me in quite a while. Yeah, he's awesome in this episode. It's a brilliant Simon episode. I did miss Maya this episode. Mm-hmm. I, uh, just apropos. Yeah, I don't know what she's up to, but yeah. she's not here. I hope Alicia had a nice week off anyway. Yeah. But it's a brilliant, brilliant Simon episode. And Alberto just shines when he's given the space to do so. Yeah. Like, it doesn't really matter what they give Simon to do. He shines in it. Like Absolutely. He's brilliant. He's no, just always, he was always awesome. brilliant. He was fantastic. But I do think that Jace was great yeah. this episode. And I think Dom did a really nice job with a quite complicated, quite subtle storyline. Yeah, I was going to say, he's like, Dom was really good, but Jace, Jace was, was awesome. great. Yeah. yeah. The work Jace was doing on himself mm. in this episode was really impressive and really striking and not something we see from him very often. Yeah. And all of your listeners will know we really appreciate characters working on themselves. Yeah. A yeah. Lot. Absolutely. So major, major, major plaudits for, for Jace but Simon Lewis is getting my vote this week. Fair enough. And do you want to give a hint for your quote of the week? So my hint this week is in a week of depressing, angsty-filled Malik lines, this was one of the only moments of lightness. Okay. Should have really gone first with my hint for my quote because mine is all about the angsty painfulness, but... It needed to be said, and now it's out there. Good. Yep. I th- I think probably you'll get ours. <laughs> I think it'll probably be okay. So that is everything. That is everything. So this episode has given us plenty of meat to talk about. Do get in touch. We will percolate on it and have a really epically long front piece to next week's discussion, <laughs> I'm sure. And until then, have a lovely weekend. Have a lovely weekend. Talk to you later. Talk to you later. Thanks for listening, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to this episode of The Descent is Easy. If you enjoyed this episode, please head over to iTunes and leave us a rate and review. That's the best way to support us. If you'd like to join in the conversation, you can find us on fascinationfrustration.com or on Tumblr and Twitter. See the show notes for links. Thanks so much for listening.